Hi, welcome to the Corporate Mavs Ultimate M1 Revision video. In this video, I'm going to go through the whole of the CM1 course, and the aim is to make sure you're familiar with every single topic that you could encounter. It's going to be really useful for students preparing for M1, but also for M2 and so on, because M1 is needed for those modules as well. So it's going to be a really useful video. The aim is to spend about a minute or two on each topic to make sure you're familiar with every single topic that you can encounter. There's a lot of topics, so it's quite a long video. You might want to watch it in chunks. You may want to write notes on it as well. And there's also an accompanying booklet which has a question on every single slide or every single topic that I've gone through. So that's really useful for you to practice either as you go through or at the end. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So this is for CM1. So this is a calculator paper and it lasts for one hour, 45 minutes. And here's a list of all the topics in M1. This revision checklist can be found in corporate maths, but I've also included it in the description below. So we've got all the topics. The red topics are the number topics, so words and figures, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and so on. Now you'll notice this is a calculator paper, uh, but there are non-calculator topics such as addition, subtraction, and so on. So it, you know, it's mentioned that you're meant to cover these in class before your M1 exam. So it's important that you know them. You might be given a question which has been done incorrectly. So even though it's a calculator paper, you then might have to spot a mistake or so on. So so every single topic that is mentioned in that specification or in these lists, it's important that you are aware of how to do them. So we've got the number topics in red. In green, we've got the geometry of the shape, space and measure topics there, such as 2D shapes, nets, timetables, circumference and so on. In orange, we've got our statistics topics, our data handling or statistics topics, such as questionnaires, scatter graphs and so on. And in blue, we've got our algebra topics. This is a very important checklist. I'd recommend you print this off and have a copy of it as well. Now, as I said, there's an accompanying booklet. Um, I've made the ultimate CM1 revision question booklet, which has questions on every single topic that we go through. So whenever we do the first topic in this video, there'll be questions on that and so on. And they're all sort of in the same order as this video. The front of the booklet will look something like this. There are QR codes. The QR code here, whenever you scan it on the booklet, will bring you to this video. And whenever you scan the QR code on the right, the answers, it will bring you to the answers. Uh, don't bother scanning these QR codes because they just bring you to corporatemaps.com. Throughout this video, I'll mention the revision card. I've actually borrowed some of the revision cards as we go through. The revision cards might be really useful because they cover lots of M1 topics and they'll also have topics which might be useful for M5 or if you're doing M2 and M6 and so on in there as well. Um, so the revision cards, I mention them quite often as I go through the video and I will use bits of them. And if you do want to buy them, there is a link in the description below as well. And also whenever you're preparing for M1, I'd highly recommend looking at the numeracy and foundation five a days. You can access those through the website for free, but if you do like books, then you can buy the books as well on the website. Okay, so let's get started. So the first topic is words and numbers. So this is, and every single topic I go through in the top right-hand corner, there will be the corresponding videos on corporate maths. So if you go to www.corporatemaths.com and click on videos and worksheets, if you scroll down to video 362 and 363, that will give you a more in-depth explanation. The idea of this video is to spend a minute or two going through every single topic to make sure you're familiar with them. But if you do need that extra bit of help on a particular topic, the videos are mentioned for you there as well. And if you also want to do some questions on the topic, beside these video numbers are either practice questions and textbook exercises. But as I said, if you're using the booklet, there will be questions on this topic in that booklet as well. So our first topic we're going to cover is words and figures. So sometimes we're asked to write a number that's in words as figures or a number that's in figures in words. So our first question says, write 6,840 in words. Now, whenever we're writing a number in words, we write it as we said. So if I was reading this, I would say 6,000. 840. So that's what I would write down. I would write down 6,000, 840. So whenever you're writing numbers as words, you write them down as you say them. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is operations. So in M1, you're expected to know your four operations, your addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So I'm going to go through how to work these out now. So our first question says 381 plus 64. So let's write it out in columns. So 381, you've got the three in the hundreds column, your eight in the tens column, and your one in the units or ones column. And then we've got 64. So let's write that beneath 64, lining up the ones or the units and the tens, and let's just add it together. So one plus four is five, so put the five beneath. 8 plus 6 is 14, so we put the 4 down and we carry the 1. And 3 plus 1 is 4, so our answer is 445. Okay, our next question. So our next question is 514 subtract 175. And again, with subtraction, I would write them down in columns. So 514 subtract 175. 
and lining them up. We've got four take away five, well we can't do so we're gonna borrow, so let's borrow the 10 and make that 14. 14 take away five is nine. Now we've got zero take away seven. Now we're gonna borrow from the five, so we'll call that a four and put a one there to make 10. 10 take away seven is three, and four take away one is three. So 514 take away 175 is 339. Okay, so our next question is 83 multiplied by 12. So 83 multiplied by 12. So I just line them up like so. And then I do two times three is six. And then two times eight is 16. So we write one six. So we've done two times 83. Now we're gonna do 10 times 83. So we'll put our zero down. One times three is three. And one times eight is eight. And let's add them up. Six plus zero is six. Six plus three is nine and one plus eight is nine. So 83 multiplied by 12 is equal to 996. Okay, our next topic, which is division, which is video 98. So we're gonna do 1032 divided by six. So I tend to use short division or the bus shelter approach. So 1032 divided by six. So how many sixes go into one? Well, that's zero, remainder one. How many sixes go into 10? Well, one, remainder four. How many sixes go into 43? Well, seven times six is 42, so it's going to be seven, remainder one. And how many sixes go into 12? Well, that's two. So we've got 172, so our answer is 172. Okay, so we've gone for operations, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is real life negatives or ordering negative numbers. So that's video 208 and 209 on Corbett Mavs. And here's a typical question where we've been asked to write the cities in order of temperature from coldest to warmest. So here's the map of the UK and Ireland and we've got Belfast with negative 8 degrees Celsius, Cork at negative 7 degrees Celsius, Cardiff at 0 degrees Celsius, London at 2 degrees Celsius, Newcastle at negative 4 degrees Celsius, and Aberdeen at negative 6 degrees Celsius. So we've got those cities and we've been asked to order them in order of temperature from coldest to warmest. So if we have a look, Belfast is the coldest at negative 8. Then we've got negative 7, which is Cork. Then we've got Aberdeen, which is negative 6, so Aberdeen. After that, then we've got Newcastle, Cardiff, and London left. Well, Newcastle has a temperature of negative 4 degrees Celsius, so Newcastle. And then we're left with Cardiff and London, while Cardiff is 0 degrees Celsius. And finally, the warmest city is London with a temperature of 2 degrees Celsius, so London. So in order from coldest to warmest, the cities would go Belfast, Cork, Aberdeen, Newcastle, Cardiff and London. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is arithmetic, which involves negatives. So our first question is 6 subtract 10. Well, 6 take away 6 is 0, so if we do 6 take away 10, it's going to be a negative number. And if we take away 6, we get the 0, we'd have another 4 to take away, so our answer would be negative 4. So 6 take away 10 is negative 4. Our next question, negative 7 plus 12. Well, if we're at negative 7 and we add 7, we get to 0. And then we'd have another 5 to add, so our answer would be 5. So negative 7 plus 12 is 5. Our next question, our well, next question is negative 13 take away 4. So that means we're going to go 4 more down from negative 13. So that'll be negative 14, negative 15, negative 16, negative 17. So the answer will be negative 17. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. So our next question says 5 plus negative 3. Now when we add a positive number, it goes up. When we add a negative number, it goes down. So we're going to do 5, add negative 3. would be the same as 5 take away 3. And 5 take away 3 is equal to 2. Our next question, our next question is eight subtract negative seven. Now when you subtract a positive number, it goes down. When you subtract a negative number, it goes up. So here we're gonna do eight plus seven. And eight plus seven is equal to 15 because eight minus minus seven is 15. Eight plus seven is 15. And our last question here, we've got negative 10. Now we're adding negative five. Now when you add a positive number, it goes up. When you add a negative number, it goes down. So we're gonna be adding a negative, which is the same as taking away. So we've got negative 10 take away five and negative 10 take away five would be negative 15. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is multiplication and division involving negatives. So let's go through our rules. Well, a positive times a positive is a positive. A positive times a negative is a negative. A negative times a positive is a negative, and a negative times a negative is a positive. And the way I remember this is, if they're both positive, whenever you're, whenever you're multiplying, you get a positive answer. And if they're both negative, you get a positive answer. So if they're both the same, you get a positive answer. And whenever you're multiplying, you've got one positive and one negative, you get a negative answer. So let's have a look at our first question. So our first question is eight multiplied by negative three. Well, eight times three is 24. 
but we've got a positive times a negative. And when we've got a positive times a negative, we've got one of each is going to be a negative answer. So instead of being 8 times 3 being 24, the answer will be negative 24. And let's have a look at our next multiplication. We've got negative 5 multiplied by negative 4. Well, it's a negative times a negative, so our answer is going to be positive. And we've got 5 times 4, which is 20. Now, the same rules apply for division. So let's have a look at our first question. So our first question is negative 64 divided by 8. Now, it's a negative divided by a positive. So we know it's one of each. So it's going to be a negative answer. And 64 divided by 8 is 8 because 8 times 8 is 64. So 64 divided by 8 is 8. So negative 64 divided by 8 would be negative 8. And our next question, we've got negative 30 divided by negative 6. So it's a negative divided by a negative, so we're going to get a positive answer. And we'll get 30 divided by 6, that's 5, so the answer would just be 5. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is ordering numbers and ordering decimal numbers. And there are videos 221 and 95 on corporate maths. And this question says, arrange in order, starting with the smallest, 7.81, 7 7.9, 7.3, 7.407, 7.102, and we've been asked to arrange them in order starting with the smallest. So let's start off by finding the smallest number here. Now they all start with 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, so that's not going to help us. So let's look at the next one to the right of the decimal point, which is the tenths column. And we're looking for the number with the lowest number of tenths. Well, this one has eight tenths, this one has four tenths. This one has three temps. This one has zero temps, so that's going to be our candidate for our smallest number. And this one's got one temp, so this is going to be our smallest number. So we've found our smallest number. Now let's carry on. Let's keep looking at the temps column. We have eight temps, four temps, three temps, and one temp. So our next one would be 7.102 and then carrying on and again we're looking at the temps column now if you did have some numbers which have the same digit in the temps column you'd look at the hundredths so our next number well we've got 7.81 7.49 and 7.3 so that's got a three in the temps column so that's our next smallest and then next would be 7.49 because it's only got a four in the temps column and finally our biggest number would be 7.81 and that's it so we've arranged the numbers in order from smallest to largest so our next topic is to look at the inequality sign. Now, there are four different inequality signs you're going to need to know for M1. They are the smaller than symbol, the greater than symbol, the smaller than or equal to symbol, and the greater than or equal to symbol. And these are our four inequality signs. So we use these to show that either one number is perhaps bigger than another number, or smaller than another number, and so on. So let's have a look at this question. The question says, write the correct symbol in each box to make the statements correct. So. Our first box, we've got 58 and 55. Now, 58 is bigger than 55, so we're going to put in the greater than symbol. Um, I'm going to avoid talking about crocodiles. Um, my daughter likes to say, you know, the crocodile eats the bigger number, so they say the inequality sign is going to eat the 58 and so on. Um, I remember as the greater than, you know, the bigger side going towards the bigger number. So here we've got 58, and then we've got the, you know, the, the bigger part of the inequality sign here, and the smaller part pointing towards the smaller number. Um, but however you want to remember it, it's important important to know these signs. So 58 is bigger than 55. Next, we've got 99 and 101. Well, a 101 is larger than 99. So we're going to put the larger side towards the 101 or the less than symbol. So we've got 99 is less than 101. And finally, we've got 151 and 149. Well, 151 is bigger than 149. So we're going to put the greater than symbol in, which is this one with the bigger side towards the 151. So we've got 151 is greater than 149. And that's it. So our next topic is use of a calculator. Now, M1 is a calculator paper, so it's very important, first of all, that you've got your calculator, that you're familiar with it, you bring it to class every lesson, and you're really confident with using that calculator. And you could perhaps be asked to work something out on the calculator, which will involve you knowing how to put in fractions or square roots and things like that. So here we've got a question. It says to work out 19.1 subtract 2.5 divided by the square root of 20. And we'd have to type this in our calculator. So let's have a look at some of the calculator buttons which are quite useful. Now, first of all, if I wanted to type this in, because you've got that line, that fraction, I would press the fraction button, this button here. And whenever I press that button, my display would look something like this. Next, then I would type in the top line, the numerator of the fraction, the top line of the fraction, that 19.1 subtract 2.5. So we'll just type in 19.1 subtract 2.5. 
Then I would press the down arrow here to bring me down to the denominator. And then I would want to type in the square root of 20. So I would press the square root button, which is here, which is next to the fraction button, this one. So it appears on the denominator here. And then I would type in 20. And then whenever you type in 20, my calculator display should look something like this. And then I would press equals. Now, depending what mode your calculator is in, you might get two different displays. If you press equals, you could get this display, which says 83 times the square root of 5 divided by 50. If it comes up like that and you want it as a decimal number, you then press this button here, SD, this button here. And whenever you press that, it then would display it as a decimal number for you. And it would come up as 3.711872843. So you could be asked a question to work out something which involves you typing something into your calculator. And if you want to recap that topic in corporate maths it would be video 352. Okay let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is order of operations. Now whenever you're given something to work out it's very important that everyone works it out in the same way and sometimes on social media you'll see these questions and people are answering it in different ways and they're getting different answers and a lot of the time it just depends on this order of operations. Now the video is 211 on corporate maths. Now some people call it bod mass, some people call it bid mass, um, you know, it's got different names. I tend to call it order of operations. Um, I just remember there's an order, like a hierarchy. It starts off with any brackets. So you look for any brackets. Then you look for any orders or indices. And that's like, a that's a, a sort of sounds complicated, but it's just anything with a squared or a cubed or a square root. Then you look for any divisions and multiplications, and they're of the same importance. So if you've got a question which has divisions and multiplications only, you work from left to right. And finally, you work out any additions or subtractions. And they're again of the same importance as each other. So if you've got a question which has just additions and subtractions, you work from left to right. So let's have a look at our first question. So our first question says, work out five plus 10 multiplied by two. Now, whenever I'm looking at this, the first thing I'm looking for is any brackets. No. Then I'm looking for any squares or cubes or square roots. No. Then I'm looking for any divisions or multiplications. Yes, we've got this 10 multiplied by 2. That means we need to do 10 multiplied by 2 first. So 10 multiplied by 2 is 20. So this is 20. So I'm going to write 20, and I'm just going to write it directly beneath the 10 multiplied by 2. But in front of that, we still had 5 plus. So I'm going to write 5 plus. And we've got 5 plus 20, and 5 plus 20 is equal to 25. Okay, let's have a look at our next example. So our next question says, work out 2 plus 8 squared. So again, we're going to look for any brackets. No. Then we're going to look for any orders. That's your powers, your squares, your cubes, your square roots. As you can see, there's a squared there. So we're going to work out that first of all. We're going to work out 8 squared. Now, later on in the video, we're going to go through squares. So if you haven't got that far, you, you know, you might want to come back to this if, whenever you've done that. But squared means to multiply by itself. So we're going to do 8 squared. Well, that's 8 times 8, which is equal to 64. And we write it directly beneath it, so 64. And we still have the 2 plus in front, so 2 plus 64. And 2 plus 64 is equal to 66. And that's it. So it's very important you follow the correct order of operation. OK, let's have a look at our next topic. So the next topic is arithmetic with decimals. So we're going to look at adding and subtracting decimals. We're going to look at multiplying decimals. And we're going to look at division involving decimals. So let's start off with our first question. So our first question says, work out 4.2 subtract 1.79. Now, whenever you're adding and subtracting decimals, you do it in the same approach as addition and subtraction as you've seen earlier on in the video. But it's just very important that you line up the numbers so that the decimal points are all in a line. So we'd write 4.2, like subtraction, you'd put the first number at the top, and then you're going to put the next number beneath it. Now, we've got 4.2, so we're then going to write 1.79. And we've lined them up in columns. We've got our ones or our units, the four and the one. We've got our decimal points lined up. We've got the tenths lined up, and we've got the hundredths lined up. Up. As you can see, there were no hundreds for the 4.2. So what I'm actually going to do here is just so there's a, a placeholder in there, I'm going to put a zero there as well, just so that whenever I'm subtracting these, there's something there. OK, so let's then put the line beneath. So now what we're going to do is we're going to work out a subtraction. Now, before I do that, I tend to put the decimal point in the right place. So I just line up and put a decimal point in my answer beneath the other decimal points. And let's work out the subtraction. So zero take away nine, well, we're going to need to borrow. So that's going to be a one and a ten. 10 take away 9 is 1. 1 take away 7, again, we can't do, so we're going to borrow. So that would be a 3 and an 11. 11 take away 7 is 4. And 3 take away 1 is 2. So 4.2 subtract 1.79 is 2.41. And you use the same approach as addition, where, you again, you line up the numbers with the decimal points, and then you add them. 
So let's have a look at our next question. So our next question is multiplication involving decimals. Now there's two common approaches for this question. One approach is to count the number of decimal places in the question, and then that means that the answer will have the same number, and to put the decimal point in like so. Or then there's a second approach, which is my favorite, and I'll talk about that in a second. So if, if I had 0 0.8 multiplied by 0 0.3, well, ignoring the naught point and the naught point, you'd be left with 8 times 3. Now, 8 times 3 is equal to 24, so the answer will have a 2 and a 4 in it. And then if we look at the question, you have one digit after the decimal point here, and then we have another digit after the decimal point here. So because it's two digits after the decimal point in the question, there's going to be two digits after the decimal point in the answer. So it's going to be 0 0.24. And as you can see here, the two and the four are digits after the decimal point. So that's one, two. So then that would be the right answer. 0 0.8 multiplied by 0 0.3 is 0 0.24. Another approach which is quite useful is instead of doing 0 0.8 multiplied by 0 0.3 is to change these into whole numbers. So multiply 0 0.8 by 10 to get 8 and multiply 0 0.3 by 10 to get 3 and do 8 times 3 is equal to 24. Now we made 0 0.8 10 times bigger and we made 0 0.3 10 times bigger. So that means we've made our answer 100 times bigger. We've multiplied by 10 and by 10 again. So if we divide our answer by 100 or divide it by 10 and by 10 again, we'll get our answer. So 24 divided by 10 would be 2.4 and divided by 10 again would be equal to 0.24 and that's it okay let's have a look at the next topic so the next topic is division involving decimals so we've got work out 11.4 divided by 3 now whenever i'm dividing a decimal number by a whole number well that's quite nice actually you can just use the bus shelter method as normal but just make sure that you put your decimal point in so 11.4 the first number goes under the bus shelter or a short division and we've got the decimal point here so we put it there in the answer and we're going to divide that by three so we put the three at the front three into one doesn't go so put the zero remainder one We've then got 3 into 11. Well, 11 divided by 3, well, 3 times 3 is 9, so that would be 3, remainder 2. And then we've got 24 divided by 3. Well, 24 divided by 3 is 8. So the answer would be equal to 3.8. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. So our next question says, work out 15.7 divided by 0 0.2. Now here we've, we're dividing by a decimal number, which is a wee bit trickier. So what I, I tend to want to change this number into a whole number. Now, one thing to notice is if I had six divided by three, well, six divided by three is two. If I multiply both these numbers by 10 and I done 60 divided by 30, well, how many 30s go into 60? Well, that's also two. Or if I times both of these numbers by 100 and said, what's 600 divided by 300? That's also two. So whenever you multiply both the number you're dividing and the number you're dividing by, by 10 or 100 or 1,000, after you do the division, the answer will always be the same. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to multiply both of these numbers by 10, so that will give me 157 divided by 2. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to work out the answer to this question, and whatever the answer will be will be the same as the answer to the question we were asked. So we're going to do 157 divided by 2. So the answer will be 78.5. So 157 divided by 2 would be 78.5. So that means the answer to our question would also be 78.5. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is multiples, or video 220. And here's part of the Corporate Maths Revision card on multiples. So the multiples of 4 are 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, and so on. So 4 times 1 is 4, 4 times 2 is 8, 4 times 3 is 12, 4 times 4 is 16, and so on. Or you could just start off with 4 and then add 4, add 4, add 4, and so on. So it says, work out the first five multiples of 12. Well, the first multiple of 12 is going to be 12. And then I could do, well, 12 times 2 is 24. 12 times 3 is 36. 12 times 4 is equal to 48. Or I could just be adding 12s here and do 12 plus 12 is 24, plus 12 is 36, plus 12 is 48, and add another 12 will be equal to 60. And that's it. So the first five multiples of 12 would be 12, 24, 36, 48, and 60. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is common multiples, which is video 218. So common multiples, so if we wanted to find common multiples of two numbers, we are looking for numbers that are multiples of both of those numbers. So we've been asked to find three common multiples of six and eight. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to list the, the multiples of six, I'm going to list the multiples of eight, and then I'm going to look for some common multiples. Now we've been asked to find three common multiples of six and eight. So we're looking for numbers that are in both of these lists, in the multiples of six and in the multiples of eight. So first of all, I noticed that we've got 24 because 24 is a multiple of 6, but it's also a multiple of 8. The next number that I notice is 48. 
as in both of the lists. And actually, the next number I'd write down as a multiple of six would be, well, adding six, well, 60, 66, add another six is 72. And there we've got our three common multiples. So the first three common multiples, obviously there'd be loads more, infinitely many more. Um, but the we were asked to list three of them. Um, and the first three that I can find are 24, 48, and 72. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is factors, and that's video 216 on corporate maths. And this is part of the corporate maths revision card on factors. So factors of a number are whole numbers that divide into it without a remainder. So it says, find the factors of 20. Well, 1 times 20 is 20. 2 times 10 is 20. And 4 times 5 is 20. So that means the factors of 20 are 1 and 20, 2 and 10, and 4 and 5. And whenever we put them in order, they would be 1, 2, 4, 5, 10, and 20. And they're the whole numbers that divide into 20 without a remainder, because you can divide 20 by 1, 2, 4, 5, 10, and 20, and you'll have no remainder. Okay, so let's find the factors of 30. Well, 1 times 30 is equal to 30. Then we could try 2. Well, 2 times 15 is equal to 30. Let's try 3. Well, 3 times 10 is equal to 30. Now 4, well 4 times 7 is 28, 4 times 8 is 32, so 4 is not a factor of 30. Let's try 5, well 5 times 6 is equal to 30. Now we've done 5 times 6, that's actually all the numbers we can try because we've done 1, 2, 3, we've tried 4, we've tried 5, and then we've got to 6, so that's it. And let's list them as factors, so let's list them in order, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 10, 15, and 30. And remember, if you do want to practice some questions on factors, if you go into that booklet, that M1 revision booklet, practice question booklet, um, there will be questions there on factors and all the topics that we've done so far. So it's very important that after you've watched me go through a topic to pause the video, maybe write some notes on it, try some questions, and then carry on. Okay, our next topic is common factors. So we've looked at common multiples. Now we're going to look for common factors. So whenever you're finding common factors of two numbers, you write the factors out for both of those numbers, and you look for factors that are factors of both of those numbers. So the factors of 20, well, 20, well, we had 1 times 20, we've got 2 times 10, and we've got 4 times 5. They're all the numbers, the whole, the whole numbers are multiplied together to give you 20. So 1, 2, 4, 5, 10 and 20 and 30 we've just done 30 they were 1 2 3 5 6 10 15 and 30 now we're looking for common factors of 20 and 30 well one's a common factor of both of them straight away two also now three is not on the list for 20 four is not on the list for 30 five is a common factor Six isn't a common factor, it's not on the list for 20. 10 is a common factor, it's in both of the lists. And then 20, 15, and 30, none of those are common factors. So the common factors of 20 and 30 would be one, two, five, and 10. Okay, so our next topic is prime numbers, and this is the Code Maps Revision card on prime numbers. So we've got a prime number is a number with exactly two factors, one on itself. So five is a prime number, as its factors are one and five. So 9 is not a prime number, as its factors are 1, 3, and 9, because obviously 9 is 1 times 9, but it's also 3 times 3. So it's actually got three factors, whereas a prime number only has two factors, one in itself. And here's a list of our prime numbers, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23, 29, 31, and so on. And it's very important to know these prime numbers. And if you want to recap on prime numbers, watch video 225 on Corporate Maths. So our next topic are square numbers. And again, I'm using the Corporate Maths revision card. And these revision cards are really useful, particularly if you do have a set of them, you can sort of set these, you know, the ones that I'm going through, you can set these cards out and sort of pin them up or you can blue tag them onto the wall so they're there to revise. So square numbers, that's video 226 on Corporate Maths. But here's the revision card. A square number is a number that you find by doing one times one, two times two, three times three, and so on. So one times one is one, so one's a square number. 2 times 2, or 2 squared, is 4, so 4 is a square number. 3 squared, that's 3 times 3, which is 9, so 9 is a square number. 4 times 4 is 16, so that's a square number, and so on. And the square numbers are 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, 64, 81, 100, 121, 144, and so on. I would learn these first 12 square numbers off by heart. It's just really useful to know them, okay? So these are your first 12 square numbers. 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, 64, 81, 100, 121, and 144. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. 
Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is squaring numbers, which is video 227. So our first question says, work out 30 squared. So that little two is squared. We've looked at it already in order of operations and perhaps use of a calculator as well. Uh, so this is the squared symbol. It's a little two above the number. And what that means is you have to multiply the number by itself. So whenever it says work out 30 squared, you do 30 multiplied by 30. So we do three times three is equal to nine, and it would have one, two zeros. So the answer would be 900. Now remember that M1 is a calculator paper, so it's very important to know where the squared button is on your calculator. So my squared button looks something like that. So it's got a little X with the squared symbol. So if I wanted to work out something such as 1.5 squared, I would type in 1.5, and then, so I type in 1.5, and then I would press the squared button like so, and my calculator would look something like this, and then I would press equals, it would give me my answer of 2.25. So the square number on a calculator, make sure you're familiar with this button here. And you could try it out, try it out on seven squared equals, and you should get 49 and so on. So squaring a number, you just multiply that number by itself. Okay, our next topic. Okay, so our next topic is to square root, and square root is the inverse of square, so it's the opposite operation. So for instance, if you know that five squared is 25, the square root of 25 is 5. It's going back to it's finding the number that you would multiply by itself to give that answer. And the square root symbol looks something like this. It's this symbol here. And our first question says, work out the square root of 49. Well, 7 times 7 is equal to 49. So the square root of 49 is equal to 7. And it is a calculator paper, so make sure that you know where the square root button is on your calculator. Mine's is this button here. It's got the little square root and a little white square beneath it. And if I wanted to work out the square root of a number, I would press that button to get the square root symbol. And then I would just type in, so if my question said to work out the square root of 32.49, I'd press that button and then I would type in 32.49 and then I would press equals and then it would give me my answer of 5.7. And that's it. So the square root is the inverse of square, and it's finding what number was squared to give you the number beneath the square root symbol. So if you had the square root of 49, it would be 7. If you had the square root of 100, it would be 10. And there's a square root button on your calculator. And if you want to watch more practice on this, watch video 228 on Corbin Maths. Right, so our next topic is cube numbers. So a cube number is the result of multiplying a number by itself and by itself again. So we've got one cubed, that's the cube symbol, is one times one times one, which is one. Two cubed is two times two times two, which is eight. Three cubed is three times three times three, which is 27. Four cubed is four times four times four, which is 64. And five cubed is five times five times five, which is 125. I tend to learn these ones off by heart, so the first five cube numbers are 1, 8, 27, 64, and 125. Also, I tend to learn that 10 cubed is a 1,000, just because 10 times 10 times 10 is a 1,000. So these are the cube numbers that I would learn off by heart. Okay, our next topic. Okay, so our next topic is cube root. So the cube root is the inverse operation to cubing. So in other words, you're saying what number do you multiply by itself and by itself again to give you the number under the cube root. So the first question says, find the cube root of 8. Well, 2 times 2 is 4, multiplied by 2 is 8. So the cube root of 8 is equal to 2. This is the cube root symbol, so it's like the square root, but it's got a little 3 above it there. So it says work out the cube root of 125. Well, that's going to be 5, because 5 times 5 times 5 is 125. But it's also important to know how to use it on the calculator, because remember, M1 is a calculator paper. And just above the square root symbol, you've got the cube root symbol here in yellow. So to press this button on the calculator, what you do, first of all, because it's in yellow, you press Shift. So the button here, shift, and then you press the square root button. And then on your calculator, the cube root symbol will come up like so. Then you just type 125. So you've got the cube root of 125, and then press equals, and you'll get the answer of 5. And that's it. So that's it. So to find the cube root of a number, you just figure out what number do you multiply by itself and by itself again to get that number. And on the calculator, it's usually above the square root button. So you just press shift, and then the square root button, and then that would bring you up the cube root symbol. So our next topic is place value. So it's very important to know place value. So you get your decimal point and then go into the left or the first column. I tend to call it units, but it's also called ones. So you've got your ones or units. Then you get your tens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundred thousands and millions. And go into the right of the decimal point, you've got your tenths, your hundredths, your thousandths and so on. And here's a typical place value question. So the question says, write down the value of eight in the answer to 183 multiplied by 100. 
So let's start off by working out the answer to 183 multiplied by 100. So we've got 183, so 183. And we're going to multiply by 100. So that means we're going to move the digits two columns to the left. Each of the digits is getting 100 times larger. So the 1 would move into the tens of thousands. The 8 would move into the thousands. The 3 would move into the hundreds. And then we've got zeros. So the answer to this question would be, would be 18,300. And the question says write down the value of the 8 in the answer to that question. So the 8's in the thousands column. So the answer would be 8,000. So the value of the 8 in the answer to that question would be 8,000. Okay, it's very important in M1 that you know how to round numbers. So our first question says round 235 to the nearest 100, and this is the Corp Maps revision card. So we're rounding 235 to the nearest 100. So because 235 is in between 200 and 300, so our answer will either be 200 or 300. So if we consider where it is on the number line, we've got 250 in the middle, and 235 would be below 250, so 235 on the number line would be somewhere like here. So that means that it's closer to 200 than it is to 300. Now some people would just like if you round into the nearest hundred they would look in the tens column and see it's a three and because that's below 250 below the five that means you round down so if the number in the tens column is a zero a one a two a three or a four you would round down here if it was a five a six a seven an eight or a nine you would round up but i tend to just think what's in the middle of 200 and 300 because we know it's in between 200 and 300 which is 250 that's below it so we're going to round down Okay, our next question. Our next question says round 7,680 to the nearest thousand. So because it's to the nearest thousand, it's either going to be 7,000 or 8,000 because that's the two thousands that's in between. So we've got a number line here between 7,000 and 8,000. In the middle would be 7,500, and that number is clearly above it. So it would look something like this, where the number is above 7,500. So that means that our number is closer to 8,000 than it is to 7,000. So the answer would be 8,000. Again, another way to look at it is because we're rounding to the nearest thousand, we would look in the hundreds column. We've got a six there, which means we round up, so the answer would be 8,000. And finally, it's important to be able to round to decimal places as well. So we're going to round 5.18 to one decimal place. So we've got 5.1 and 5.2 because 5.18 would be in between 5.1 and 5.2. So we want to figure out if 5.18 is closer to 5.1 or 5.2. Well, in the middle would be 5.15. So 5.18 is much closer to 5.2 than it is to 5.1. So the answer would be 5.2. And again, because we're rounding to one decimal place, we could have just looked at the second decimal place, which is an 8, which then would tell us that we're going to round up, so it's going to be 5.2. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic, which is rounding to one significant figure. It's important in M1 to be able to round to one significant figure. Uh, it's quite useful for estimation as well. And we've got some numbers here. This is, again, the Core Maps Revision Card, and we've got our number, 394, 1,273, and so on. And we're going to round each of these numbers to one significant figure. So rounding to one significant figure, well, it makes the number much more easier to deal with because it's just going to be one number followed by zeros. So if we had 394, that's closer to 400 than it is to 300. So the answer would just be, 400. We've got 1,273, where we're only allowed just one number followed by zero, so we're either going to have 1,000 or 2,000. This is closer to 1,000, so our answer would just be 1,000. Then we've got 7,961, so again we're allowed just one number followed by zero, so we could have 7,000 or 8,000. This is closer to 8,000, so to one significant figure we would have 8,000. And again, like with rounding, some people, if you're rounding to one significant figure, they look at the second digit and they figure if it's five or above, you round up. If it's four or below, you round down. So here we've got 394. The second significant figure is the second digit. So that's the nine. So we round up to 400. 1,273. Well, the second significant figure, the second digit is a two. So we round down to 1,000. 7,961, the second significant figure is a 9, so we're rounding up. Okay, let's have a look at our next one. So our next one's a decimal number, and whenever we're dealing with significant figures and decimals, you ignore the naught points and so on, all the zeros at the front, and you're looking for the first digit that's not a zero whenever it's a decimal number. So we've got 0.618. So our first significant figure here would be the 6, you ignore the zero, and our second one would be a 1. Because it's a 1, it's below. Four, it's 4 below, so you round down, so it's going to be 0 0.6. Another way to look at it would be, if you had 0.618, it's either going to be 0 0.6 or 0 0.7. This is closer to 0 0.6, so the answer would be 0 0.6. Okay, let's have a look at our last one. So our last one, we've got 20.501. Because we've got a two at the front, that's significant, and then that's our first significant figure, and then it's followed by zeros, that would be significant. It's only not significant if it's at the front, the zeros. So like here, it was no point, so we just ignored that and look at the six. But here we had our two, so that's 
that's significant. That's our first one. Second one, third one, fourth one, and fifth one. So we want to round it to one significant figure. So we just want one number followed by zeros. So this number is 20.501. So to one significant figure, you could have 20 or 30. This is much closer to 20. So our answer would be 20. Right, so let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is equivalent fractions, and that's video 135 in Corporate Maths. So here we've got two fractions that are equivalent to each other, one half and five tenths. And as you can see, one half is the same as five tenths. Now for two fractions to be equivalent to each other, the numerator and denominator must be multiplied or divided by the same number to get an equivalent fraction. So as you can see here, if we multiply one by five, we get 5, and if we multiply the denominator of 2 by 5, we get that's equal to 10. So we've multiplied the numerator by 5, and we've multiplied the denominator by 5, and that's given us an equivalent fraction. And it also works for division. If we started with the 5 tenths, if we divide it by 5 and divide it by 5, then you get a half. So for two fractions to be equivalent to each other, the numerators and denominators must be multiplied or divided by the same number. So here we've got two thirds, and that's equal to 8 over blank, and we're trying to find this missing number for these equivalent fractions. So to get from 2 to 8, we multiply by 4, so multiply by 4. So we've multiplied the numerator by 4, so let's multiply the denominator by 4. So let's do 3 times 4. And 3 times 4 is equal to 12. So 2 thirds is equal to 8 twelfths. They're equivalent to each other. Okay, so let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is simplifying fractions, or cancelling down fractions. So here we've got three fractions, and we're going to cancel them down. We're going to simplify them. So let's have a look at our first one. So our first question says to simplify 6 eighths. So to simplify 6 eighths, we see what we can divide them both by, or what are the common factors. Now, with the two numbers, they'll always have a common factor of 1, but dividing them by 1 won't help us simplify it or make the numbers any smaller. So we're going to look for common factors apart from 1. So with 6 and 8, I can divide both of these by 2. So let's divide 6 and 8 both by 2 and see what we get. Well, 6 divided by 2 is 3, and 8 divided by 2 is 4. So our answer would be 3 quarters. So whenever you simplify 6 eighths, that's the same as three quarters. Okay, our next one. So our next one is 15 25ths. So we're looking for a common factor. What can we divide both of these numbers by? And well, 15 and 25, they're both in the five times tables. So let's divide both of them by five. Well, 15 divided by five is three and 25 divided by five is five. So then we get three fifths and three and five, well, we can't divide these by anything. Well, you know, we could divide them by one, but that's not gonna change anything. So we've simplified it as far as possible. Okay, let's have a look at our last question. So our last question is to simplify 12 8 times. Now 12 8 times, you can actually divide both the numerator and the denominator here by different common factors. We could divide both of them by two, and that would give us six over nine. But as you'll notice here, six and nine are both divisible by three. So then you'd divide both of them by three, and that would give you two over three. We could have divided 12 8 times both by 3 because both of these numbers are in the 3 times tables. And if we divide both of them by 3, we get, well, 12 divided by 3 is 4. And 18 divided by 3 is equal to 6. So you get 4 sixths. Now they're both even, so you can divide them both by 2 to get 2 thirds. Or alternative, you might have noticed that 12 and 18 are both in the 6 times tables. So you do, you can, if you can divide them by the highest common factor, that would be fantastic if you can spot it. So 12 and 18, you can divide both of them by 6. 12 divided by 6 is 2, and 18 divided by 6 is 3. So you get to 2 thirds. So whenever you're simplifying fractions, you might be able to cancel it down to the final answer straight away. Or sometimes you might want to just half both of the numbers to give you sort of smaller numbers, then you can divide again and so on. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So the next topic is to find a fraction of a shape. So here we've got a grid, and we've been asked to shade in two thirds of the grid. Now, whenever you're finding two thirds of this grid, you can do it in different ways. You could say, well, if I'm shading in two thirds, that's two out of every three squares. So if I had a look at this top row, you've got three squares, and you could shade in two of them, shade in, shade in, and leave blank. Then go to the next row and shade in, shade in, and leave blank. And then the last row, again, you could go shade in, shade in, and leave blank. Um, <laughs> my shade is terrible there. Um, so that's one way you could do that question. Uh, so you could just consider as in if you're being asked to shade in two thirds, you'd shade in two of them, but leave one blank. Or if you were to shade in three quarters, you'd shade in three of them and leave one blank and so on. Alternatively, you could have looked at the columns here and you could have said, well, there's three columns, one, two, three. I need to shade in two thirds, so I could shade in two columns and leave one blank, and then that would have worked as well. Alternatively, you could have said, well, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine squares. And then look, using the one of the topics that I'm gonna go through in a minute, which is finding the fraction of an amount, you could work out two thirds 
of 9 and that would be 6 as well and then you would just shade in the 6 squares that's it okay so fraction of a shape and that's video 143 on corporate maths so our next topic is to express as a fraction so sometimes you're asked to express something as a fraction so here's a typical question it says write two days as a fraction of three weeks so here we've got three weeks and three weeks well the seven days in a week so three times seven is equal to 21 days so we've been asked to write two days as a fraction of 21 days and so we would just write down two days out of 21 or 2 over 21 and that's it so to express something as a fraction whatever the total is you put that on the denominator and whatever you've been asked to write as a fraction of that total you put on the numerator and that's it okay let's have a look at our next topic so our next topic is to work out the fraction of an amount now to work out a fraction of an amount you divide by the denominator and you multiply by the numerator so let's have a look at two questions here so we've been asked to work out one third of 24 so to work out a third of 24, well, the denominator is 3, so I'm going to take my 24 and I'm going to divide it by 3. We're dividing by the denominator. So 24 divided by 3 is 8, so we've got 8. And then we would times that by the numerator. Now the numerator is just 1 here, and 8 times 1 is just 8, so the answer would be 8. So to find a fraction of an amount, you just divide by the denominator and multiply by the numerator. If the numerator is 1, you could just divide by the denominator. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. We've been asked to work out 4 fifths of 35. So again, we're going to take our 35 and we're going to divide by the denominator so we're going to do 35 divided by 5 and 35 divided by 5 is 7 because 5 times 7 is 35 now we're going to take that 7 and we're going to multiply by the numerator 7 multiplied by 4 and 7 times 4 is equal to 28 so 4 fifths of 35 is equal to 28 and that's it. Now this is a very important topic where you're quite often asked to find fractions of amounts, whether it's in the exam or whether it's even in real life in a shop and so on. Um, so working out fractions of amounts is very important and that's video 137 on Corbett Maths. So our next topic is adding fractions. Now in M1, the fractions that we're going to have to add are quite straightforward. We're going to be either adding fractions with the same denominator or simple fractions where you can find it quite a simple equivalent fraction and then you can work that out quite nicely. Okay, so our first question says to work out 2 ninths plus 5 ninths. Well, if I had 2 ninths and I added another 5 ninths altogether, there'd be 7 ninths. So there would be 7 ninths. So whenever we're adding fractions with the same denominator, you just add whatever the numerators are. We're adding 2 ninths and 5 five ninths to get seven ninths. Okay, so let's have a look at our next question here. So here we've got three quarters plus one eighth. Now, as you can see, the fractions here don't have the same denominator. And it's very important whenever you're adding fractions for the fractions to have the same denominator. I've drawn a sketch, and as you can see, there's three quarters and there's one eighth. Now, with three quarters, what I can do is I can find an equivalent fraction, which is an eighth. If I had, imagine this is a pizza, if I cut it into eighths like so, you would see all together there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sections. And we've got one, two, three, four, five, six six of them shaded in. So three quarters is the same as six eighths. And whenever we covered earlier in the video equivalent fractions, you'll have seen that we can multiply both the numerator and denominator by two to get six eighths. Now we're adding one eighth. Now if I've got six eighths and I add one eighth altogether, that would be seven eighths altogether. And that's it. And as you can see here, whenever we add them together, we get seven eighths. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that's it. So if the denominators of the fractions are the same, you can just add the numerators together. So if you had two ninths plus five ninths, that's seven ninths. And if the denominators of the fractions aren't the same, what you need to do is make them the same by finding equivalent fractions. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is to order fractions, and this is video 144 in Corporate Maths, and we've been asked to arrange in order smallest first, three quarters, two thirds, five sixths, and seven twelfths. So what we're going to do is we're going to make all these fractions have the same denominator. So if we've got four, three, six, and twelve, we want to make all these denominators the same number. Now what's great is, if you notice here we've got seven twelfths, well, we can times four by three to get twelve, we can multiply 3 by 4 to get 12, and we can double 6 to get 12. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find equivalent fractions, but all of them are going to have 12 on the denominator. And then we can look at them and see which one's the biggest and so on. So we've got 3 quarters. Well, to get from 4 to 12, you multiply by 3. So we're going to need to multiply the numerator here by 3. Well, 3 times 3 is 9. So 3 quarters is 9 twelfths. To get from 3 to 12 you multiply by 4 so you need to multiply this numerator by 4 2 times 4 is equal to 8 so 2 thirds is the same as 8 twelfths we've got 5 sixths well to get from 6 to 12 you double it or you multiply by 2 so doubling 5 would give us 10 
And then finally, well, we had seven twelfths, so that's seven twelfths. Now we need to arrange in order. And as you can see here, we've got nine twelfths, eight twelfths, ten twelfths, and seven twelfths. As you can see, the smallest one would be our seven twelfths. So in order, it would be seven twelfths. Then our next smallest, so we've done that one, our next smallest would be this one, which was 8 twelfths, but in the question it was 2 thirds, so let's write what they gave us in the question, which is 2 thirds. Next, we've got our 9 twelfths, and again in the question they give us 3 quarters, so let's write that down, 3 quarters. And finally, the largest fraction was our 10 twelfths, which is 5 sixths, so we'll write that down, 5 sixths. So our answer is 7 twelfths, 2 thirds, 3 quarters, and 5 sixths. And just remember, if you want to practice any more questions like this, that booklet is really useful, that M1 question booklet. So if you go to the description and click on that, you'll find that there'll be questionnaire and order and fractions. Okay, our next topic is percentage of amounts. And this is a very important topic. And quite often we'll be asked to do it either with or without a calculator. I'm going to do it without a calculator to begin with. And then I'm going to show you how to do it on a calculator, especially as M1 is a calculator paper. So this is videos 234 and 235 on corporate maths. Now, whenever I'm working out percentage of amounts, without a calculator, I tend to remember these four building blocks. You've got 50%, to find 50% of something, you divide by two. To find 25% of something, you divide by four, or you half it and half it again, and that will give you 25%, so that's divided by four, or half and half and again. Then we've got to find 10%, you divide by 10, and to find 1%, you divide by 100. And with these four building blocks, we should be able to work out these questions quite nicely. So our first question says, work out 25% of 60. So to find 25% of something, you divide by 4. So we're going to take our 60 and we're going to divide it by 4. So 60 divided by 4, well, to divide by 4, you could divide by 4 using our short division, or you could divide it by 2 and divide it by 2, or half it and half it again. So 60 halved is 30, and halved again is 15. So the answer would be 15 centimetres. Okay, our next question. Our next question says find 60% of 800. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find 50%, I'm going to find 10%, and then I'm going to add them together. So if we take our 800 and we take 800 and we divide it by two, we will find 50%. So 800 divided by two is equal to 400. So that's equal to 400, so that's 50%. Now we wanna find our 10%. So to find 10%, we divide by 10. So we take our 800 and we divide it by 10. And 800 divided by 10 is 80, and that's 10%. Now we want to find what 60% is, so we would add these two together. So if we add our 50% and 10%, we will find 60%. Now 400 plus 80 is 480. So 60% 60 of 800 is equal to 480. Okay, and our last question. Our last question says find 5% of 90. Now to find 5%, I tend to want to find 10% and then half it. So let's find 10% of 90 to begin with. So to find 10%, we divide by 10. So we're going to do 90 divided by 10. And 90 divided by 10 is 9, so that's 10%. So we find 10% is equal to 9, but we want 5%, which is half of 10%. So if we do 9 divided by 2, that's equal to 4.5. So the answer would be 4.5. So whenever we find a percentage of amounts with a calculator, there's two common approaches. One of them is to find 1% and then multiply by the percent you want. So for instance, if we were asked to find 19% of 240, what I would do is I would divide 240 by 100 to find 1%. So I would do 240 divided by 100 to get 1%. And because it's a calculator, you can type in 240 divided by 100 and you get 2.4, so 2.4. And then if we wanted to find 19% of 240, I would just take our 1%, which is 2.4, and I would multiply by the percent we want, which is 19. So then you do 2.4 multiplied by 19, and you'll find an answer of 45.6 and that's it so 19% of 240 is 45.6 so to find the percentage of an amount on a calculator I tend to divide by 100 to find 1% and then multiply by the percent you want and there is another approach and that's by changing the percentage that you want to find of the number into a decimal so changing 19% to a decimal that's 0.19 this is called a multiplier and you multiply the 0.19 by the 240 and that would give you 45.6 as well so if you want to find a percentage of an amount on a calculator you can divide by 100 to find 1% and times by the percent you want or you could change the percentage of the amount you want to find, so 19% into decimal, and then you can multiply that decimal, that multiplier, by the number you're finding the percentage of. So you could do 0.19 times by 240. Okay, so our next topic is expressing as a percentage. Now we've looked at expressing as a fraction, so let's look at expressing as a percentage. And that's video 237 on Corporate Maths. So whenever I'm expressing something as a percentage, I tend to express it as a fraction first of all, and then I change it into a percentage. So the question says, in a box there's 20 counters. 
9 of the countries are blue, what percentage of the countries are blue? So I can express that as a fraction to begin with. I know that 9 of the countries are blue, so I know there's 20 countries in the box, and 9 of them are blue. So that means that 9 20 of are blue. Now, if I'm doing this on a non-calculator paper, I want to get this to a percentage, which means that I want to write this as a fraction with 100 on the denominator. To get from 20 to 100, we multiply by 5. So 20 times 5 is 100. I then look at my numerator, which is 9, and I times that by 5 as well. And 9 times 5 is 45. So that means that if I know that 9 twentieths of the counters are blue, that would be the same as 45 out of 100 being blue, which is 45%. So that's how I would do it without a calculator. But if I was doing this on a calculator, what I would tend to do is I would write it as a fraction to begin with, which is 9 over 20, like so. And then I want to change that into a percentage. So I would just do 9 divided by 20 on my calculator. And 9 divided by 20 on my calculator is equal to 0 0.45. So I would just do the division, 9 divided by 20. And that gives it as a decimal, 0 0.45. And then I times by 100. So I times by 100. And that would give me 45%. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Now, I've called it increasing by percentage. I've also including here decreasing by percentage because it could be increasing by or decreasing by percentage. And that's video 238 in Corporate Maths. And let's have a look at two examples. So our first question says, increase 40 by 30%. So to increase 40 by 30%, I tend to want to work out what 30% of 40 is to begin with. So if I take our 40, and we're going to find out what 30% is. So to find 30%, I'm going to get 10% to begin with. So divide by 10 to get 10%. So 40 divided by 10 is 4. So 10% of 40 is 4. That's 10%. Now, I want to find 30%. So it's going to be 3 lots of 10%. So that's going to be 4 plus 4 plus 4, or you could do 4 times 3, and that would be equal to 12, and that is equal to 30%. So I know that 30% of 40 is 12. Now we've been asked to increase 40 by 30%, so we're going to increase 40 by 12. So I'm going to do 40 plus 12, and 40 plus 12 is equal to 52. So to increase a number by a percentage, you work out that percentage off the number, and then just add it on to what you started with. And likewise, decreasing by percentage, and this would be quite important if you're going into a shop and there's discounts and so on. We're going to decrease 250 by 9%. And this is a calculator question, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take our 250, and I'm going to work out 9% of it to begin with. So to find 9% on my calculator, I'm going to divide by 100 to find 1%, and then times by 9 to find 9%. So 250 divided by 100, that's 1%, which is equal to 2.5. And then I'm going to take my 2.5, and I'm going to multiply by 9, and that would tell me 9%. So 2.5 times 9 is equal to 22.5. Now we've been asked to decrease 250 by 9%. So that means we're going to take our 22.5 away from what we started with. So we're going to do 250, take away 22.5. And when we do that, we get that's equal to 227.5. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is equivalent fractions, decimals, and percentages. So very important to know that if you had a half, that's the same as 0.5, which is the same as 50%. Or a quarter is the same as 0.25, which is the same as 25%, and so on. So it's very important to know these key fractions, decimals, and percentages. So for instance, knowing that 7 tenths is the same as 0.7, or 7 tenths, which is 70%. So it's important to know these key equivalences here. And the, this is the Code Mouse Revision Card on Fractions, Decimals, and Percentages. But it's also important to know how to change a fraction to a decimal, or a fraction to a percentage, a decimal to a fraction, a decimal to a percentage, and a percentage to a fraction, a percentage to a decimal. And it's important to know how to change between these. And if you watch video 121 all the way up to video 129, that will show you in detail how to change between each of them. One way which I tend to do is I just learned to change a fraction to a decimal. I did the numerator divided by the denominator, so that gives me 0 0.5. 1 divided by 2 is 0 0.5. The change from a decimal to a percentage, I times by 100. So 0 0.5 times 100 is 50, so then I write 50%. And then if I want to go the other way, if I wanted to write a percentage as a decimal, I just divide by 100. And then to write a percentage as a fraction, I just, because it's a percentage, I know it's out of 100, so I would write 50 over 100, and I would cancel it down to 1 half. And that's it. Okay, so let's have a look at some questions. So here's a table, and we've been asked to fill in the missing numbers. So 1 half, well, a half is the same as 0 0.5. And if you do 1 divided by 2, you get 0 0.5. As a percentage, well, 0 0.5 times by 100 is 50. So it's going to be 
Here we've got 0.25 and 25%. Well, I know straight away off by heart that's equal to a quarter. But if I didn't, I would write 25 over 100 because that's a percentage. And then I would cancel it down and simplify it. So I could divide both of these by 25. So 25 divided by 25 is 1. And 100 divided by 25 is 4. So that would be 1 quarter. So that's 1 quarter. Here we've got a fifth. So we've got 1 fifth. And that's 20%. So let's divide our 20% by 100 to get it as a decimal. So 20 divided by 100 is 0 0.2. So that would be 0 0.2. So 1 fifth is 0 0.2, which is 20%. And finally, we've got 0 0.17. Well, let's write that as a percentage to begin with. So let's multiply this by 100. So 0 0.17 multiplied by 100. Well, that would move the one two columns to the left. So it would be in the tens. The seven would move two columns to the left. So it would move into the units or ones. So it would be 17%. So that would be 17%, and as a fraction, that's 17 over 100, and I don't think that can be cancelled down, no. So that's it, so 17 over 100, and that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is simple interest. So simple interest is where interest is added on to money in a bank account, and simple interest is where the same amount is given every single year. So the question says, £600 is invested for three years at 5% per year simple interest. Work out the total interest. So in this question, we're told that it's 5%. So let's work out 5% of 600. So let's take our 600 and divide it by 100. So that'll tell us 1%, which is 6. And then take our 6 and multiply it by the percent we want, which is 5. 6 times 5 is equal to 30. So every single year, because it's simple interest, every single year, £30 of interest is earned. So in the first year, £30 added on. In the second year, £30 added on, and so on. And we've been asked to work out the total amount of interest. So the money's been invested for three years. So that means that three lots of 30 has been earned in interest. So 30 multiplied by 3 is equal to 90. So the question asks us to work out the total interest earned. So that would be £90. And that's it. If we were asked how much money would be in the bank account at the end of the three years, that 90 would be added on to the 600, so that would be 690 pound. But the question just asks us for the total interest, so that would be 90 pound. Okay, so let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is Best Buys, which is video 210 on Corporate Maths. So here we've got a question, a Best Buys question, that says packets of biscuits are sold in two sizes. You've got a regular box of biscuits, which has 10 biscuits for 95p, well, you've got a large box of biscuits and we've got a large box of biscuits which is 15 biscuits and it costs £1.50 and the question asks which packet of biscuits is better value for money now there's two ways which I typically answer questions like this so using the first approach we could divide the total cost the 95p by the 10 biscuits to find the cost per biscuit so I could do 95p divided by 10 and that will tell me how much it costs per biscuit in the regular box. So 95 divided by 10 is 9.5p. So it's 9.5p per biscuit here, per biscuit. And in the large box, it's £1.50, which is 150 pence. And that's for 15 biscuits. So you can divide a 150 for 150 pence by 15 biscuits. And that would tell us that's equal to 10p per biscuit. So 9.5p per biscuit is cheaper than 10p per biscuit. So that means that the regular box is better value for money. So that's one approach to divide the total amount by how much you get. Another approach is to buy the same amount of biscuits by either buying just the regular boxes or the large boxes. So with the regular box, I could buy 10 biscuits, I could buy 20 biscuits, I could buy 30 biscuits by buying just regular packets. Or with the large box, I could buy 15 biscuits, or if I bought two packs, that would be 15 plus 15, which is 30 biscuits. Ah, so I could buy three regular boxes, and that would be 30 biscuits. So that would be three boxes at 95 pH, so three times 95 P, which is equal to 285 P, or £2.85. Or alternatively, if I was looking at just the large boxes to buy 30 biscuits, well, 30 biscuits would be two boxes of those. So that would be two lots of £1.50. And two lots of £1.50 is £3. So if I wanted to buy 30 biscuits, I could buy, use the regular boxes, which are 95 pH, and that would cost me £2.85. Alternatively, I could use the large boxes to buy the 30 biscuits, and that would cost me £3. So as you can see, it's better value for money to buy the regular boxes. So the regular is better value. Okay, our next topic is money. Now, in with money, there's lots of different possible questions you could be asked on money. And if you go to video 400 in Corporate Maths, you, you find this video 400A, 400B, 400C, and so on. And they've got lots of different types of money questions. I'm going to show you one particular type of question now. So it says, a ruler costs 70p. Adrian has £10. Adrian buys as many rulers as he can. How much change does he receive? Now, first of all, we're told that each ruler costs 70p and he's got £10. Now, I'm going to change the £10 into pence. So each pound is 100 pence, so £10 would be 1,000 pence. 
So he's got 1,000 pence, and he's going to buy as many rulers as he can. So let's get our calculator, and we're going to divide the amount of money he has, the 1,000, by 70. And that'll tell us how many times 70 goes into 1,000. And when I do that, I get 14.285714, and so on. So that means this 70 goes into 1,000 14 and a bit times. Now, if he goes into the shop, Adrian can't buy 14 and a bit rulers. He can buy 14 rulers. He doesn't have enough money for his 15th ruler. So we know that he buys 14 rulers. Now, we know each ruler costs 70 pence. So if we do 14 times 70, we will find the total amount of money it costs for the 14 rulers. So 70p multiplied by 14 rulers. And when we do that, we get that's equal to 980 pence. So £9.80. But Adrian had £10 or 1,000 pence. So if we take our 1,000 pence or our £10 and we take away the 980 pence, we see that there's 20p left over. That's how much change Adrian would receive. So Adrian receives 20p change. Right, so let's move on to our geometry or shapes based on measure topics. So this is video number one, which is names of 2D shapes. It's very important to know the names of the different 2D shapes. So let's start off with our polygons. We've got our triangle, which is a three-sided shape, quadrilateral, four sides. Pentagon, that's five sides. If it's got six sides, it's a hexagon. Seven sides, a heptagon. Eight sides, octagon. Nine sides, nonagon. And ten sides, decagon. Also, make sure you know your circle, semicircle, and so on. Okay, our next topic. And it's also important in M1 to know the difference between your irregular polygons and your irregular polygons. So a polygon is a straight-sided shape. Regular polygons are where all the sides are the same length. So your square, equilateral triangle, here's a regular pentagon, a regular hexagon, and so on. Also, as well as the sides all being the same length, the angles are all the same size. So for instance, in your square, all the angles are 90 degrees. In an equilateral triangle, all of the angles are 60 degrees each, and so on. Irregular polygons are where the sides and the angles aren't all the same. So the sides could vary in length and the angles can vary. So the next topic is going through types of triangles. So it's important to know that you've got your right angle triangle. So that's a triangle with a right angle. Our next type of triangle is the isosceles triangle. The isosceles triangle has two equal length sides. So for instance, this side on the left and the side on the right for this one. So for instance, if this was 10 centimeters on this side, this side here would also be 10 centimeters. Also, as well as having two sides the same length, we've got two angles the same size. This angle and this angle would be the same. You've got your equilateral triangle, all the sides are the same length, and all the angles are the same, they're all 60 degrees each. And finally, we've got a scalene triangle, and a scalene triangle is a triangle where none of the sides are the same length, and none of the angles are the same. And if you want to go through that in more detail, video 327 on Corbett Maths goes through the types of triangle. Our next topic is quadrilaterals, and that's video 2 on Corbett Maths. Here are some quadrilaterals, we've got our square, rectangle, rhombus, trapezium, parallelogram and kite. Now in terms of their properties, the square, all sides are the same length. It's got four right angles. It's got four lines of symmetry down through the middle, across and diagonally as well. It's got an order of rotational symmetry four. Then we've got a rectangle. For the rectangle, the opposite sides are the same length. So the top and the bottom will be the same length and the left and the right hand side of this rectangle would have the same length. Each of the angles are 90 degrees. It would have two lines of symmetry and order of rotational symmetry two. Now we've got a rhombus. With a rhombus, all the sides are the same length. It's got two lines of symmetry, so down through the middle and across. It's got an order of rotational symmetry two. And in terms of the angles, the opposite angles are the same size. Our next shape, so we've got a trapezium, and the trapezium has one pair of parallel lines, so the top and the bottom of this trapezium are parallel to each other. Also, sometimes it has a line of symmetry, so this trapezium does have a line of symmetry, a lot of the time it doesn't. It would have order of rotational symmetry one, and yeah. Okay, our next shape, our next shape is a parallelogram. A parallelogram has two pairs of parallel lines, so the top line is parallel to the bottom, and also the right-hand side is parallel to the left-hand side. The opposite angles are the same as each other, so the top left angle here would be the same as the bottom right, and the top right would be equal to the bottom left. Um, it would have order of rotational symmetry two, and this parallelogram would have no lines of symmetry. And finally, we've got a kite. A kite would have one line of symmetry going down through the middle. Uh, the angle on the left and the right of this kite would be equal to each other, and yeah. Okay, and if you want more details in terms of quadrilaterals, watch video to incorporate maths. Okay, our next topic. Our next topic is 3D shapes. Here are some common 3D shapes you need to know the name of. So you've got your cube, cuboid, sphere, cone, cylinder, 
triangular prism, square base pyramid, and pentagonal prism. That's just an example of a prism. Um, so we've got these different 3D shapes. You're going to need to know the names of them. Also, you're going to need to know what edges are, vertices are, and faces are. And let's have a look at those now. So here we've got a vertex. So a vertex is a corner. So with this cube, it would have eight vertices. Vertex means one of them. When you've got more than one, it's vertices. So it would have eight vertices. That's eight corners. Four in the top, one, two, three three and four and four in the bottom as well so it'd have eight vertices the cube would have six faces so here's a face at the front a face on the top a face on the right there'd be a face on the left the back and the bottom as well and just think of a dice it's got six faces and in terms of edges edges join the vertices it would have 12 edges so it would have one going along the top here one two three four and then it would have four going downwards one two three and one at the back and then it'd have four in the bottom so it'd have 12 edges okay it's also important to know what nets are and this is the core mass revision card on nets so here are the nets of six 3d shapes so you've got your cube the net of the cube so it would fold round and then the two sides would fold up so that would be the net of a cube so here's the net of a cuboid the net of a square base pyramid so this square would be the base and then the four triangles would fold up to meet at a point then you've got a triangular prism so this would be the base and then the two sides would fold up and then the two triangles would fold up to fill in those spaces so that would be the, the net of a triangular prism here we've got the net of a cone and the net of a cylinder and it's important to know what nets are if you want more practice on nets watch video four and court maths Okay, so our next topic is parallel and perpendicular lines. So two lines that are always the same distance apart are parallel lines. So the two lines will never meet. So here we've got an example of parallel lines. People often think of railway tracks whenever they think of parallel lines. And so it's a good one to think of. In terms of perpendicular lines, perpendicular lines are lines that cross at 90 degrees. So if you've got two lines that are perpendicular to each other, the angle between them will be 90 degrees. And that's it. So parallel lines are lines that are always the same distance apart. They never meet. And lines that cross at 90 degrees are perpendicular. So our next topic is line symmetry, which is video 316 in CorporateMavs.com. So an isosceles triangle has one line of symmetry. Then we've got a rectangle. A rectangle has got two lines of symmetry, a vertical one and a horizontal one. It doesn't have a diagonal one because if you tried to fold it over, the corners wouldn't go to the right place. So a rectangle's only got two lines of symmetry, whereas a square's got four lines of symmetry. So vertical, horizontal, and the two diagonals. So a parallelogram, it has no lines of symmetry. An equilateral triangle has three lines of symmetry, and a regular hexagon has six lines of symmetry. So it's important to be able to tell if a shape has got lines of symmetry or not. Okay, our next topic. Our next topic is rotational symmetry. So our next topic is rotational symmetry. And to find the order of rotational symmetry of a shape, whenever we spin it through 360 degrees, we count how many times it lands on itself. So here we've got a rhombus, and as we spin it through 360 degrees, as you can see, it lands on itself once, when it's upside down and twice when it gets back to its original position. So a rhombus has order of rotational symmetry two. Now our question says, circle the shape which has order of rotational symmetry four or rotational symmetry order four. So we've got a heart, it would have order one, it would only have its final position. We've got a square, as you turn that through a full circle, it lands on itself four times. So that will be our shape. That will be the shape which has order of rotational symmetry four. This five pointed star, it would have order of rotational symmetry five. And this isosceles triangle would only have order rotational symmetry one. As you turn it around for a full circle, it would only land on itself once. So a shape has got rotational symmetry whenever it lands on itself more than once, whenever you turn it through a full circle. And to find the order of rotational symmetry, you just count how many times it lands on itself whenever you spin it through a full circle. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is types of angle, and here's the Cobra Maps revision card. So we've got an acute angle, and they're small angles. They're between zero and 90 degrees. So this is an acute angle. The next type of angle, here we've got a right angle. So it's a right angle if it's equal to 90 degrees. So if it's 90 degree angle, that's a right angle. Next, we've got an obtuse angle. Obtuse angles are bigger than right angles. They're bigger than 90 degrees, but less than 180 degrees. Then you've got a straight line, which is 180 degrees, and angles bigger than that. So bigger than 180 and smaller than 360 degrees would be a reflex angle. So we've got an acute angle, a right angle when it's equal to 90, an obtuse angle, and then a reflex angle if it's bigger than a straight line. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So it's important in M1 that you're able to draw angles and measure angles. So here we've got an angle and let's measure it. So let's take our protractor and let's measure this angle. So if we put the protractor on the angle, so like so, where we've got the cross of the protractor on the center of the angle, so here, where the two lines meet, and then one of the lines is on zero, and we're gonna count around to whenever we get to the other line. So as you can see, we've got zero degrees, 
10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 120, 130, 140, and we've got to 145, so this is a 145 degree angle, 145 degrees. And it's important whenever you're measuring angles that you start at zero and you come round to the other line. If it was the other way around, you might need to look at the angles on the inside, so start at zero and come round the other way. Okay, let's do our next question. Our next question says to draw a 60 degree angle. So we're going to draw a 60 degree angle. So let's put our protractor so that it is the cross of the protractor is at the end of the line and that we've got zero on the line. And we're going to count around to whenever we get to 60 degrees. So as you can see, the zero is on the inside this time. So we're going to go around to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. So 60 degrees would be here. So there. And then we're going to get a ruler and a pencil. And you're going to draw a nice straight line starting at the point at the center here through that point there and that means that that would be a 60 degree angle so let's label it so let's put an arc in there and then write in 60 degrees and that's it we've drawn a 60 degree angle so it's very important to be able to measure and draw angles and therefore it's really important to have your protractor in every single one of your maths lessons ready to use it okay our next topic our next topic is measuring lines sometimes we're asked to measure line segments such as this line a b and as you can see here we've got our line a b a is the beginning of the line so here and b is the end of the line here we've been asked to measure the length of the line so it's important whenever you're measuring lines that you use the centimeters. It's very rare in maths so you use the inches side. So we're going to get our centimeters. So we're going to put our zero at the beginning of the line, and we're going to see how long the line is. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six centimeters. So this line is exactly six centimeters long. So it'd be six centimeters. So if we went a little bit further, it could be 6.1 or 6.2 centimeters or so on. But this is exactly six centimeters. So this line AB is six centimeters. Okay, our next topic. Our next topic is angle facts, and it's very important to know these angle facts. So for instance, that a right angle is 90 degrees, a straight line would be 180 degrees, the angles on a triangle add up to 180 degrees, the angles on a quadrilateral add up to 360, and so on. So these are very important angle facts. So here we've got a right angle, and that means that these two angles will add up to 90 degrees. So if we know that one of them is 70 degrees, we can take that away from 90 to see what's left of the other angle. So if we do 90 subtract 70, that's equal to, well 90 subtract 70 is equal to 20, so that means that this angle X would be 20 degrees. Here we've got a straight line, and this time we've got a little right angle marked in here, so that means that this angle is 90 degrees, so let's put in 90 there, 90 degrees, and we're trying to find out this angle here, this X. So we've got two angles, and we know what's left would be this angle X, so the, all three angles will have to add up together to give you 180 degrees. So if we add the two that were given, the 90 and the 55, we can see what's left. So let's do 90, add 55, and that's equal to 145 degrees. And if we take that away from 180, we'll see what's left for x. So 180, take away 145 is equal to 35 degrees. So that means that x is equal to 35 degrees. So the angles in a right angle will add up to 90 degrees, and the angles in a straight line will add up to 180 degrees. And if you ever see a little right angle symbol, write 90 beside it. Okay, the next ones. So here we've got a full circle. The angles in a full circle or a full term will add up to 360 degrees. So here we've got one angle, an obtuse angle, which is 140 degrees, and we want to see what's left for this reflex angle. So if we take the 140 degrees away from 360, we'll see what's left for x. So do 360, take away 140, and that's equal to 220 degrees. So that means that this angle x is 220 degrees. Okay, next we've got two lines that cross each other. Now when you've got two lines, two straight lines that cross each other, the opposite angles are equal to each other. So that means that x here would be equal to 156 degrees, and the y would be equal to the angle opposite it. These are called vertically opposite. When you've got two straight lines that cross each other, the opposite angles are always equal to each other, and they're called vertically opposite. So here x will equal 156 degrees, because it's vertically opposite to the one we're given. And then to find the y, well there's two ways we can find this. One way is to just look at the straight line and say, well, y and 156 is in a straight line. So if we take 156 away from 180, we can find y. Or another way to do it is to look at the full circle and say, well, if you've got 156 here, and this is 156, you can add those two together to be 312. And you can take 312 away from the full circle, which is 360, to see what's left for y and the one opposite it. And when you know that amount, divide it by two, half it to see what y is. So I'm going to do it using just a straight line approach here, that I know that y and 156 is in a straight line. So I'm going to do 180 minus 156, and that's equal to 24 degrees. Okay, and if you do want extra practice in these angle facts, the useful videos for you on Corporate Maths are 35, 30, 
34 and 39. Okay, let's have a look at our next questions. This time we're going to look at angles in a triangle, which is video number 37, and the angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees. So here we've got a triangle, and we've got two angles given to us, 75 and 80, and we've got our missing angle x that we need to find. So if we add the two angles we're given, the 80 and the 75, we can then take that away from 180 and see what's left. So 80 plus 75 is equal to 155 degrees, and then if you do 180, take away 155, that leaves us with 25, so it means that x is equal to 25 degrees. Next we've got an isosceles triangle. Now you remember from earlier on in the video, with an isosceles triangle, two of the angles are the same. So as you can see here, we've got our two lines that are the same length, and the two angles here and here, this one and the 35, will be equal to each other. So it means that this angle is 35 degrees. So that means to find the angle x, we'll add our 35 and 35, and then take that away from 180. So 35 plus 35 is equal to 70 degrees. And then if we do 180, take away 70, that's equal to 110 degrees. So the angle x is equal here to 110 degrees. And if you do want extra practice on these, remember there is that practice booklet of questions for M1. You can find it in the description below. Our next topic is angles in a quadrilateral. So here we've got a four-sided shape. Every single time you add on an extra side of a shape, you add on 180 degrees to its angles. So you know that with a triangle, the angles add up to 180. If we add another side in, that means that now the angles in a quadrilateral will add up to 360 degrees. So that means that if we add up the angles that were given here, the 70, the 50, and the 90, here's a right angle, you can then take that answer away from 360 and see what's left for x. So 70 plus 50 is equal to 120 degrees, plus 90 is equal to 210 degrees. Now we're going to take that away from 360, so 360 take away 210 is equal to 150. So that means that x is equal to 150 degrees. And that's it. So the angles in a quadrilateral add up to 360 degrees, and that was video 33 in Corporate Maths. Okay, our next topic. Our next topic is angles and parallel lines. Now, whenever you've got two parallel lines and a line that crosses them, a straight line that crosses them, you'll find that many of the angles are the same. Um, because as you can see, you've got lots of vertically opposite angles. Like for instance here, this obtuse angle is vertically opposite to this one, so they're the same. This acute one's equal to that one. Now, as it's a straight line that crosses the two parallel lines, then the angles below will be exactly the same. You'll also have a 75, 75, and so on. Now we've got some special names to use whenever we're talking about these angles being the same as each other. So if you've got two parallel lines and a line that crosses it, and you've got this Z shape, these are called alternate angles because they're alternate to each other. So this 75 is the same as this 75 because they're alternate angles. And it's very important to know that, that word alternate angles. Try not to use Z angles, use the term alternate angles. So this angle is the same as this angle because they're alternate to each other. Here, these angles, these green angles, are 130 degrees, these obtuse angles, and they're the same as each other, so they're called corresponding. Because you've got, if you look at it, you've got the angles at the top and the angles at the bottom. They're both in the bottom right corner, here and here, so they're corresponding to each other. The bottom right angle and the bottom right angle are the same, because they're corresponding. Some people call it an F angle, because you've got this F shape, <laughs> and the angles at the bottom below the F are the same, uh, but try to learn the word corresponding. So here we've got a question just to practice we remember which one's which. So we've got our two parallel lines, RS and TU, and you've got that straight line that crosses them. And we've been asked to find which angle is corresponding to A. So we've got A here, and A is the top left angle in this little section here. So if we look at the angles below at the other line, the angle in the top left there is E. So A and E are corresponding to each other, E. B would be corresponding to F, D would be corresponding to H, and C would be corresponding to C. Our next question says, which angle is alternate to C? Now, when we see alternate, we're thinking of that Z angle. And you can see here, we've got that C here. And if you look at my pen here, you've got this sort of Z shape here, where you've got the C in there and the F there. They are alternate to each other, so C is alternate to F. So C is alternate to F. D would be alternate to E, and they would be the alternate angles. C is alternate to F, and D is alternate to E. And that's it. And also, on the Court Maps Revision card, you've got those angles labelled as alternate and corresponding. So if you do have a set of those, it's very important maybe to pin that up on the wall.
and to learn those names. Okay, our next topic. So our next topic is views and elevations. So views and elevations are whenever you're looking at 3D shapes, looking at it from different perspective and considering how the shape will look if you look at it from those angles or those perspectives. So here we've got a shape. It's a load of multi-link cubes stuck together. And I'm going to look at it from different angles. We've been asked to draw what the front elevation would look like. So if I was standing here, if I was small and I was looking at it from here and this was the front of the shape, I would just see this, these four blocks, this one, this one, this one, and this one. So I would see this shape here and I could get my pencil and ruler and draw these really tidily, excuse this. And that's what I would see. I would see a rectangle that was one, two, three, four blocks across. Some people like to put in the lines as well in between because you might see those lines joining the blocks. Uh, but that's what I would see. I would see that rectangle, which is four rectangles wide. And if you do want more practice on views and elevations, look at 354, video 354 on corporatemavs.com. Okay, let's look at it from a different perspective. So again, that's the front again. Now I'm going to draw the side elevation. Now there's two different side elevations here. I could draw it from the left-hand side, or I could draw it from the right-hand side, and I'm actually going to draw both. So let's start off with the left-hand side. So if I was here at the side, and I was looking at it that way, I would again see a rectangle, and it would be one, two, three, four blocks across. So it would be four blocks across, like so. And I would draw like that, but you could put the lines in if you wanted to, going down. You might see where the blocks join, so some people would draw the lines in. So, But I would just draw like that. Alternatively, I could draw it from the other side. So I could be standing over here, and I could be looking at it from this side here. And again, I would see one, two, three, four blocks. Now, they're not all level with each other, but that's what I would see. I would see the block on the left, the block in the middle, the next one back, and the back one there. So I would see, again, four blocks. Now this time if I was drawn, I would draw the lines in like so, just to show that I would see the one on the left hand side, that one being further forward, and then I might see that one a bit further back, and that one a bit further back, and that one a bit further back. But again, it would just be a rectangle, four blocks across. Okay, and finally, we've been asked to draw the plan view. The plan view is from above, it's the bird's eye view as such. So we're going to pretend that we're above the ship and we're looking down on it. So if we were looking down at it from above, we would see our four blocks at the bottom so our four blocks were going along the bottom like so one two three four and i'm looking straight down so then on the left hand side it would go up so it would go like one two three four like so if i'm looking down from the top then it would go across and down across and down across and down and across and down so it would look something like this from above the ship and that's what I would draw. Um, again, some people put the joints in, but because they're all sort of flat, I would tend to draw it like so. And that would be the plan view, the view from above. So whenever you're drawing shapes from different perspectives, you've got the front elevation, which is the view from the front. You've got your side elevations, which are the views from the sides. And you've got your plan view, which is the view from above. Okay, our next topic. Our next topic is units, and it's very important to be able to convert metric units. So here we've got some metric units, and I would write these down. These are the conversion facts on the revision card. Again, if you've got the revision card, pin it on the wall, revise them, bring it with you on the bus, whatever, make sure you learn these facts. And there are videos 347 or 349 in Corbett Mavs also, but these are really important. One kilometer is a thousand meters. One meter is 100 centimeters and one centimeter is 10 millimeters. It's important to learn those facts off by heart. In terms of capacity, one liter is a thousand milliliters, and one liter is equal to 1,000 centimeters cubed. They're both quite important. And in terms of mass, one metric ton is a thousand kilograms, and one kilogram is equal to 1,000 grams. And these are all important unit facts to learn off by heart. Okay, and our next topic. Our next topic is sensible estimates, and it's important to be able to make sensible estimates for maybe the height of a building, or the height of a door, or the length of a bus, or the amount of liquid in a glass, or so on. And what I would do is I'd consider the items around you and make sure that you're aware of maybe some of the lengths of them, or heights of them, or maybe how much liquid or something contains, or the mass of certain objects. So for instance, the height of a person, roughly 1.8 meters. The length of a swimming pool, my local swimming pool is 25 meters long, so I remember remember that. Um, here we've got a large bottle of fizzy drink. It would hold two litres. You can get sort of smaller ones, which might be maybe 1.5 litres, or you've got the little ones that you could be 500 millilitres or, you know, so on. Uh, a can of uh, fizzy drink might be 330 millilitres. Things like that might help you estimate uh, the capacities of different objects. So in terms of the mass of objects, well, a bag of sugar is one kilogram. I've got some weights as well. So I know in terms of, you know, like a 10 kilogram dumbbell, a 20 kilogram dumbbell and so on, 30, 40, 50 kilogram dumbbells and so on, of course. Um, so in terms of the sensible estimates, there are some sort of everyday items which might be useful for you. Okay, next. 
It's important to be able to work out time calculations as well. So knowing the difference between 12 hour clock, AM, PM, 24 hour clock, uh, video 322 goes through that. So this is a typical question, and the question says, Ella finishes school usually at 3 p.m. And the time on her watch is 13.14. So that's a 24-hour clock, and let's change it to p.m. So it's obviously in the afternoon because it's past 12, so it's 13, so it's p.m. And to find the time here, well, we've got 13. Well, if you take away 12, you're left with 1. So that'd be 1.14 p.m. And Ella's looking at her watch and seeing how long it's left until she finishes school. Um, not sure why she's looking forward to the end of school. And the question is, how many minutes is it until Ella finishes school? So Ella's got, well, it's 1.14 p.m. We've got 1.14 p.m. And we want to get to 3 p.m. So first of all, let's get to 2 p.m. Well, this is 14 minutes and there's 60 minutes in an hour. So if we add six minutes to begin with, so add six minutes, it brings us to 1.20 p.m. And then if we add another 40 minutes, that will bring us to 2 p.m. And then we've got another hour. Now we've been asked how many minutes it is until Ella finishes school. So instead of writing one hour here, I'm going to write add another 60 minutes. So let's find out how many minutes it is until Ella finishes school. So she's got six minutes and then 40 and then another 60. Well, 60 plus 40 is 100 plus 6 is 106. So 106 minutes. And that's it. So it's very important to be able to calculate questions involving time. So remember in the 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day, being able to deal with the 12 hour clock, 24 hour clock and so on. Okay, our next question. So our next topic is timetables. So here we've got a bus timetable and we've got our stops, Southville, Leake, Milton, Newtown, Red Island, Sandville and Bakerstown. And here are three buses. Each column represents a bus. So the first bus goes starts at Southville at 9.18. It arrives at Leake at 9.28 and leaves at 9.28 gets to Milton at 9.41 and leaves at 9.41 and so on. So this is the timetable. This bus stops at every single stop. This bus, the second bus stops at every single stop. And the last bus, you can see some of them have got dashes in. That means it's maybe an express bus, so it skips out some stops. So this bus goes from Southville to Red Island to Bakerstown. So the question says, Dara's traveling to Sandville. So we've got Sandville here. That's where Dara's going. And he arrives at Milton bus station. So Milton bus station at 10.45. And the question says, at what time should he arrive at Sandville? So he arrives at 10.45. Now, if he arrives at Milton bus station, he's already missed that first bus. He's because it left at 9.41. So he's not going to get this bus. So that bus is out of the question. And then we've got the second bus and it's going to leave Milton at 11.01. Now he's arrived at 10.45, so that's great. So he is going to get this bus. And the question says, it says, what time should he arrive at Sandville? So he should arrive at Sandville at 11.33, depending obviously if the bus is on time. So the quick answer would be 11.33. So we could have been asked different questions here. We could have been asked, how long is that journey? Well, if it leaves at 11.01 and it arrives at 11.33, that would take 32 minutes. It could be, how long does he need to wait until he can get the bus? And so on. But that's it, we've answered our question, what time should he arrive at Sandville? 11.33. Our next topic is perimeter on the grid. And here we've got a centimetre grid, and we've been asked to find the perimeter of this shape. So it's drawn on a centimetre grid, that means that each of the lines is one centimetre. So we've got one, two, three centimetres at the top there, three centimetres. Then another one, two, three centimetres going down. And then another one, two, three centimetres going across. And then another one going up one going across, one going up, one going across, and one going up, and we're back to the starting point. So remember the perimeter of a shape is that distance around the outside of the shape, so we just need to count those, so you could just go one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on, or you could add them up, three plus three is six, plus three is nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So the perimeter of the shape is 14 centimeters. Okay, our next topic. Our next topic is perimeter. So here we've got our rectangle and we've been asked to find the perimeter of this rectangle. Now, as we've seen earlier, with a rectangle, the opposite sides are the same length. So if the top's equal to six centimeters, the bottom will be equal to six centimeters. And if the right-hand side of the rectangle is 20 centimeters, the left-hand side would also be 20 centimeters. And we've been asked to find the perimeter of the ship, so we just need to add up those distances. So if we do 20 plus 6 plus 20 plus 6, and that will tell us the perimeter. So 20 plus 6 is 26, plus 20 would be 46, plus 6 would be 52. So the perimeter of the ship is 52, and the units are centimetres, so 52 centimetres.
Our next question says find the perimeter of this isosceles triangle. So we have an isosceles triangle, two of the sides of the same length. So as you can see, we've got two sides with the little dashes. That means that they're the same length. So that means that the left-hand side here, 7, would be also the same as the right-hand side here, 7 centimetres. We've been asked to find the perimeter, so we just need to add together 7, 10 and 7. So 10 plus 7 is 17, plus 7 is equal to 24. So the perimeter of this triangle would be 24 centimetres. Okay, so our next topic is area on a grid. So we've looked at perimeter of a shape on a grid, now we're going to look at the area of a shape on a grid. So here we've got a shape drawn on a centimeter grid. That means each of these squares has got an area of one centimeter squared. So all we need to do to find the area of the shape is count the number of squares. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And because it's eight squares and each one has an area of one centimeter squared, the area would be eight centimeters squared. And that's it. Okay, our next topic. So now we're going to look at finding the area of a rectangle. So to find the area of a rectangle, we multiply its length by its width. So here we've got a rectangle, its length is 9 and its width is 5. So we just do area is equal to length times width. So it's going to be the length, which is 9, multiplied by the width, which is 5. And 9 times 5 is equal to 45. Now make sure we put the right units on, it's centimetres, so it's going to be 45 centimetres squared. And our next question is to find the area of a square. So here we've got a square and it's got a side length of 7 centimetres. And because it's a square, that means that all sides are 7 centimetres. So that means that if the length is 7, the width is 7. So to find the area, we're just going to do 7 multiplied by 7. And 7 times 7 is 49 centimetres squared. And if you want to watch the Corp Mouse video on area of a rectangle, watch video 45. Okay, our next topic. So our next topic is finding the area of a triangle. And this is the part of the Corp Mouse revision card that, that tells us the area of a triangle. So the area of a triangle is half the base times the height. Now we can do this in two different ways. We can either half the base and then multiply by the height, or we can times the base and the height first of all and then divide by two or then half it. So here we've got a triangle and it's got a base of 7 centimetres and a height of 4 centimetres. So if we want to find the area of this, we can either half the 7, which is 3.5, and then multiply that by 4, and then that's whatever 4 times 3.5 is, or we could times the base and the height together first of all, so 7 times 4, so 7 times 4 is equal to 28, and then do 28 divided by 2, and that's equal to 14. So the area for this triangle is 14 centimetres squared. So to find the area of a triangle, you can either do the base times the height and then half it, or half the base times the height. Now here we've got another triangle, and it's got a base of 14 centimetres and a height of 5. This time I'm actually going to half the base to begin with, so I'm going to find the area, which is equal to half the base, so half of 14, and then I'm going to multiply that by the height, which is equal to 5. So half of 14 is 7, and then we're going to multiply that by 5. 7 times 5 is 35, so the area of this triangle would be 35 centimetres squared. So to find the area of a triangle, just do half the base times the height, and then that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is parts of the circle. So here we've got some parts of the circle that you need to know off by heart. We've got the radius, and the radius is the distance from the centre to the edge of the circle. We've got the diameter, that's the distance across the middle of the circle, so through the centre. You've got the circumference, that's the distance around the outside of the circle. And you've got the chord, the chord's a line that joins one part of the circle to another part of the circle. So have a look at your practice question booklet and try the practice questions on that now. Okay, the next topic. The next topic we're going to look at is finding the circumference of the circle. So the circumference is a fancy name for the perimeter of the circle. It's the distance around the outside of the circle. And the circumference of a circle is found by working out pi times diameter. So if you multiply pi by the diameter, the distance across the circle going through the center, that will tell you the circumference of a circle. Now again, M1 is a calculator paper, so it's very important to know where pi is on your calculator. And as if you look down here on my calculator, I've got a yellow pi there. So because it's in yellow, that means I need to press the shift button first of all, and then press the button here just beneath the pi symbol, and that then will bring up pi on the calculator. So in this question, we've been asked to find the circumference of a circle that has got a diameter, the whole way across, of 14 centimetres. So the circumference of the circle is pi times diameter. So it's going to be pi times the distance across the circle, which is 14. So that's going to be pi times 14. So we on a calculator, we press shift and then the pi button, this one here, it'll bring up pi. Then you'll do times 14 and then press equals and it will tell us the circumference of a circle. Now sometimes it will come up like this, 14 pi, depending on the mode of your calculator. So you'd press the SD button there and then it will tell you the circumference of a circle 
And here we've got the circumference of this circle will be equal to 43.98229 and so on centimetres. Um, I'm going to round this to two decimal places, so I'm going to write 43.98 centimetres. So the circumference of this circle will be 43.98 centimetres. And always remember your units, the circumference is the perimeter, it's the distance around the outside of the circle. So if the diameter is 14 centimetres, the circumference will be measured in centimetres also. Okay, and also we might give, be given a circle like this where we've got the radius is 5 centimetres. So remember the circumference is pi times diameter. So the diameter is the whole way across the circle. So if the radius is 5, that means the diameter of this circle would be 10. So we would do circumference is pi times diameter. So we would do pi times 10, and then you would just work out what that is. Okay, our next topic. Our next topic is the area of a circle, and if you want to revise this topic in quote miles and watch the full video, it's video 59. So the area of a circle is given by the formula pi r squared. I remember our order of operations, you square, you do any orders before you do any multiplications. So what it means is we're going to square the radius and multiply it by pi. So here we've got a circle, and we want to find the area of this circle, and it's got a radius of 6 centimetres. The distance from the centre to the edge is 6 centimetres. So the area is equal to pi r squared. So it's going to be area is equal to pi times the radius 6 squared. So what we could do is on our calculator, we're just going to type this in, pi times 6 squared. The great thing is your calculator will know the order of operations whenever you type in pi times 6 squared, and it'll work it out for you. Um, alternatively, you could do 6 squared, which is 36, and then do pi times 36, and you get the same answer. But I'm just going to type this in. I'm going to type in pi, so shift, and then the pi button here, and then that'll bring up pi, and then times by, so multiply by 6, and then squared, pressing the squared button, and then I'm going to press equals. And again, my calculator, I need to press the SD button there to get the answer. My answer would be 113.0973355. So the area for the circle would be 113.0973355. Well, I'm going to round this to one decimal place, so 113.1 centimetres, and it's squared because it's area. That's it. Now, if we were given this circle like this, where we knew the diameter being 20 centimetres, well, it was pi r squared, so it's pi times the radius squared. So if you know the diameter, you might need to half it. So in this case, the radius would be 10. So I would do pi times 10 squared. Okay, our next topic is to find the volume of a cuboid. So here's a cuboid, and we may need to find the volume of it. And the volume of a cuboid, this is from the Corbin-Miles revision card, the volume is equal to length times width times height. So if we look at this cuboid, the length and the width and the height are given to us, um, which is 7, 2, and 3. And because we're just multiplying them together, you don't need to be really strict saying, well, this one's definitely the length, and this one's the width, and this one's the height, because if we're just multiplying the three numbers, it will give us the volume anyway. So the volume is equal to the length, which I'm just going to call 7, multiply by the width, I'm going to call 2, and multiply by the height that's 3 and 7 times 2 times 3 would be equal to 42 so our volume is 42 centimeters now it's volume so we measure that in centimeters cubed so the volume of this cuboid would be 42 centimeters cubed this time we've been asked to find the surface area and here's a cuboid and we've been asked to find the surface area of a cuboid and the surface area is the area of all the faces of that particular shape so this is a cuboid so it'll have six faces you've got the top which is green you've then got the bottom which would be the same size it would have the same area you've then got the rectangle on the right hand side here in blue and that would be the same as the rectangle on the left hand side and you've got the rectangle at the front the face at the front this red one and that would be the same as the back so what we've got is we've got six rectangles we need to find the area of and we need to add them all up now the great thing is that you've got pairs of them that are the same the top and the bottom the right and the left and the front and the back are the same so if we work out the area of each of these ones so what we can do is then we consider two of them and then add them all up let's call the front one the right hand side two and the top three let's consider the front to begin with so for face one we've got the width of the rectangle is eight multiplied by the height of the rectangle which would be five because here we've got a height of five so that means that the height here of this rectangle is five so we've got eight times five and eight times five is equal to 40 centimeters squared so the area of the front is 40 that means the area of the back would also be 40 as well so i'm just going to write it there as well and then two we've got the right hand side here if we look at this rectangle it's got a length of seven and and a height of 5, so we're going to do 7 multiplied by 5, and 7 times 5 is 35, so that's 35 centimetres squared. So that means the area of this rectangle on the right-hand side is 35, and that would be the same as the rectangle on the left-hand side, so there's another 35 centimetres squared. And then the top, which is face 3, we've got 3, 
that has a width of eight and a length of seven because you've got eight here so that's going to be eight there and the seven here will be there so we've got eight times seven and eight times seven is 56 centimeters squared and the top will be the same as the bottom so we've got another 56 centimeters squared so to find the total surface area of this cuboid we're going to do 40 plus 40 plus 35 plus 35 plus 56 plus 56 and that will tell us the total surface area of this cuboid and when we do that we get a total surface area of 262 centimeters squared so the surface area is the area of all the faces of that 3d shape okay our next topic is speed distance and time so this is a very important topic it's video 299 and i'm going to look at this topic in two different ways first of all it's just by considering a speed so for instance 30 miles per hour and what that means and then i'm going to consider the formula that we use for it Okay, so if I had a speed such as 30 miles per hour, that means 30 miles each hour. So if I had one hour and I was traveling at 30 miles per hour, I would go a distance of 30 miles. If I was traveling for two hours, well, that would be two, it's 30 miles an hour, so that's two lots of 30, so I would travel 60 miles. If I travel for three hours, well, that's three hours at 30 miles each hour, so that's 90 miles, and so on. So that means that if I know the speed of 30 miles per hour, if I wanted to find out how far I've traveled, I would just multiply the speed, 30 miles per hour, by the time that I was traveling. So 30 times one is 30 miles, 30 times two is 60 miles, and so on. Likewise, if I knew the distance I traveled, so for instance, 300 miles, and I knew it took 10 hours, if I divided the distance by the time, so 300 divided by 10, that gives me 30. 120 divided by four is 30. 30 divided by 1 is 30. So if you divide the distance by the time, you get the speed. And finally, if you know the distance you travel and the speed you're traveling, well, 300 divided by 30 is 10. 120 divided by 30 is 4. 90 divided by 30 is 3. So if you divide the distance by the speed, you get the time taken. Now, sometimes this is represented in a formula triangle, like so. Some people just use that information, that speed, 30 miles per hour. Um, I like to use this, but it's, it's really up to you. So speed is distance divided by time. Distance is speed times time. And time is distance divided by speed. And I use this triangle where I just write speed, distance and time, SDT, and I cover up what I'm looking for. So if I wanted to find speed, I would cover it up and I would just do distance divided by time. If I wanted to find time, I would cover it up and I would do distance divided by speed because I've got distance over speed. And finally, if I wanted to find out the distance traveled, I would cover up the D because these are beside each other, you just multiply them, so you do speed times time. So that's one way of remembering speed, distance and time, or you could just consider that 30 miles per hour or whatever speed you've been given and work it out. Okay, so here's a typical question, and we've got a car travels 180 miles in four hours. Calculate the average speed in miles per hour for the car. So we want to find speed, so speed is equal to distance divided by time. So the car travels 180 miles, so we're going to divide 180 by the time taken, which is 4. So if we do 180 divided by 4, we find that's equal to 45. So the car is travelling at an average speed of 45 miles per hour. And we can test that if we've got 45 miles per hour. If we drive for 4 hours, that's 4 lots of 45, which is 180. So we know we're right. And that's it. So that's a typical speed distance time question. If you're asked a question where you're asked to work out how far something travels, you just multiply the speed by the time. And if you're asked to work out how long a journey should take, if you divide the distance by the speed, that should tell you how long it takes. Okay, our next topic is distance chart. So here's the distance chart, and you've got your towns, Bilton, Newtown, Portsville, Leek and Castleton. I actually saw one of these the other day in an Apple Green service station where it had all the different towns and cities and I had the distance between them. And here we've got some towns that I've just made up and the distance between them in kilometers. And we've got Bilton. And if you wanted to find, for instance, the distance between Bilton and Leek, you would just go to Bilton and you would go down until you got to the road that Leek was in. And you can see that's 95 kilometers. You could have started at Leek and went across until you got to Bilton, which again would be 95. Okay, so the question says, Jessica travels from Bilton, so here, to Portsville, which is here. So if we look at it, that's going to be 12 kilometers. Then she travels from Portsville to Castleton. So she's at Portsville and she's going to travel to Castleton. So that's 63 kilometers, 63 kilometers. And the question says, how far does Jessica travel? So she's traveled 12 kilometers to get from Bilton to Portsville. And then from Portsville to Castleton, 63. So if we add them together, 12 plus 63 is equal to 75 kilometers. And that's it. 
Okay, our next topic. Okay, so we're now going to look at the statistics or the data handling topics. So these are the topics in orange on your revision checklist. So this is video 268 in Court Mavs and it's on questionnaires. So quite often you're asked to either design a good questionnaire or to criticize one that's already been made. So here's some questionnaires with some issues and let's have a look at each of them. So the first one says, a new road will cause a lot of traffic for the village. Don't you agree? So this is a leading question because it's wanting the person answering the question to agree with them. So that's a problem. And it even if you look at the options, you've got yes, maybe, unsure. There's no option for no. And the options are quite vague. So, so that's not a particularly good question. It needs to be not leading. And there needs to be options that are clear and to cover all possible options. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. So our next question says, how many films have you watched? Now this question, it, it's, it's quite difficult to answer because most people won't remember how many films they've watched in their whole life. And the options are a little, a lot, many times. The options are quite vague. Um, one of them doesn't really make sense. So th I would say that this question can be made better by giving a time scale, maybe saying how many films have you watched in the last month? And for the options, I would give some numerical options. So 0 to 5 films, 6 to 10 films, 11 to 20 films, and maybe uh, 21 plus films and then that will cover all options okay next question so our next question says how many televisions do you own one to three four to six now as you can see here these option boxes don't include an option for zero uh, because someone may not have a television also there's not an option for more than six televisions also i would say that the the option boxes you've got one to three and four to six a lot of people may be taking one to three and um, i would maybe if i was designing this question i'd perhaps go zero one two three and actually list out um you know up to maybe six and then do seven plus okay let's have a look at our last question so the last question says how much do you spend on dvds now first of all most people probably watch their films you know via streaming nowadays rather than watching dvds uh, but this could be how much money do you spend on uh, magazines or newspapers or you know any anything really at all and the option boxes say five to ten pound ten pound to thirty pound thirty pound to fifty pound and over fifty pound now the good thing about these option boxes is first of all it's an option for over 50 so it does have that option uh, but there are some problems first of all there's no option for below five pound so i would perhaps go not to five pound and then i would then go five pound and a penny to ten pound because another problem is they overlap if you spent ten pound on dvds um which box would you take would you take the first one five to ten pound or would you take the second one ten to thirty pound or if you spent thirty pound would you take the second box or the third box so it's very important that the the boxes don't overlap so i would go not to five pound five pound and a penny to 10 pound, 10 pound and a penny to 30 pound, 30 pound and a penny to 50 pound, and then over 50 pound. Another thing I would do is with the question itself, I'd perhaps put in a time scale. So how much do you, how much do you spend on DVDs each week, each month, something like that. So our next topic is reading tables. And sometimes you might be given a table and you might be told to find some information from that table. And if you want to practice reading tables, it's 387 on corporate maths. So here we've got a table and we've got some caravans, a luxury one, a basic one, a family one, and a comfort one. And it tells you how many people they sleep. So the luxury sleep six, the basic four, the family one six, and the comfort one four. So it then tells us which caravans have cots in them, so the basic and the family one. It tells us which ones have decking, so the luxury and the comfort. And it tells us which ones have barbecues, so the luxury, the family and the comfort. And then we're given the price to hire that caravan. And the first question says, which caravan sleeps four people and costs more than £300? So let's look at the caravans that sleep four people. So we've got basic here and we've got comfort here. And the question says more than 300 pounds. So we've either got basic or comfort and the basic one costs 290 pound and the comfort one costs 325 pound. So which caravan that sleeps exactly four people and costs more than 300 pound? That's gonna be the comfort caravan, so comfort. Okay, the next question, which caravans do not have decking? So the ones that do have decking are the luxury and the comfort caravan. But the basic and the family caravans do not have decking because they're not ticked. So it would be basic. So it would be basic and family. Okay, now next topic is Venn diagrams. So we've got our circles and they overlap. And the question says the Venn diagram shows information about the drink some students like. So the students have been asked if they like tea or coffee. And the Venn diagram shows us the results. So two people do not like tea or coffee at all. Eight people like tea and coffee because this eight is inside both circles. 13 people like tea only but not coffee. Seven people like coffee only, and they don't like tea. And that's it. So the first question says, how many students do not like tea or coffee? Well, these two students do not like tea or coffee, so two. The next question, how many students like tea and like coffee? That's liking both tea and coffee. So here we've got eight people in the middle. They like tea and coffee, so eight. 
And then finally it says, how many students like coffee? Now we've got seven students who like only coffee and we've got eight students who like tea and coffee. So if we look at this circle, we've got our eight plus our seven. So eight plus seven is 15. So eight plus seven is 15. So altogether there's 15 students that like coffee. If we were asked how many students liked tea, that would be 13 plus eight. And that's it. So in M1, it's important to be able to answer these Venn diagram questions where we've got two circles. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is two-way tables. And if you want to revise two-way tables, it's video 319 on corporate maths. So here we've got a two-way table. We've got some subjects at the top, English and art, and then total. And then we've got our information about whether they passed the course or failed the course. And again, we've got total at the bottom. So we've been asked to complete this two-way table. Or well, we haven't, but I'm saying it now. We're going to complete this two-way table. Uh, so we've got, um, first of all, let's look at art. We've got 12 students that have failed art out of 19 in total. So 19 students studied art and 12 of them failed. So that must be quite a hard test. And we, we can find out how many students passed because we know there's 19 altogether and 12 failed. So if we take that 12 away from 19, that leaves us with seven. So seven students must have passed the art course. Next, well, I'm looking at this top row here for how many students passed English and art, and we can find this total. We know 25 students passed English and seven students passed art. So if we add those two together, we can get the total. 25 plus seven is 32. So 32 students passed their courses. Next, I'm looking at these totals. So we know 32 students passed the course and 13 failed their course. So if we add together the 32 and the 13, we can see how many students there are in total. So 32 add 13 is 45. So let's put that in. Next, let's look at the students that failed their courses. Well, altogether 13 students failed their course and 12 of them were from art. So that means that only one student failed English. Uh, so that means that we've got that number of one. And then finally, how many students studied English in total? Well, we've got 25 that passed and one that failed. So altogether, that'd be 26. And let's just check our answers. 26 plus 19 is 45. So that's a two way table. OK, our next topic. So our next topic is the mode. And here's part of the Corp Maths revision cards. So the mode is the value that appears most often. So here we've got the number of goals scored in eight football matches, and they are two, four, one, zero, three, two, four, and two. And as you can see, two appears most often. It appears three times. So the mode is two. So the most common result. OK, our next one. Our next one is the median. And the median is found by arranging the numbers in order and then selecting the middle value. So here we've got the number of goals scored in seven netball matches. So we've got 47, 41, 51, 58, 32, 55, and 49. Now we're looking for the median, so that's the middle value. So let's arrange them in order. So 32, and then we've got 44, and then 47, and then 49, and then 51, 55 and 58. Now we're looking for the median, which is the middle value. So I tend to cross them off in pencil, in case I need to rub them out. So cross off the smallest, cross off the biggest, cross off the next smallest and the next biggest, the next one and the next one. And we're left with 49. So 49 is the median, it's the middle value once they've been arranged in order. That question was quite nice because we had an odd number of numbers, so there was definitely one in the middle. So what happens if there's an even number of values? So let's have a look. We've got 9, 5, 4, 10, 7, and 1. So let's arrange these in order. So 1's the smallest, then 4, 5, 7, 9, and 10. Cross off the smallest, cross off the biggest, cross off the next two. And then we've got 5 and 7 in the middle. Well, to find the median, that's in the middle of those two values. So in the middle of 5 and 7 would be 6. So the median for this one would be 6. If the two numbers in the middle are the same, well, then they would just be that value. Because for instance, if it was here 8 and 8, in the middle of 8 and 8 is 8. OK, our next average. Our next average is the mean. So the mean is found by adding up all the values and dividing by the number of values. So here we've got the ages of five basketball players, and they are 23, 30, 20, 27, and 30. So let's start by adding these values up. So 23 plus 30 plus 20 plus 27 plus 30. And the nice thing is M1 is a calculator paper, so let's add them up on our calculator. And that gives us 130, so the total is 130. Now we need to divide by the number of values. So there's one, two, three, four, five values. So if we take 130 and divide it by five, that will tell us the mean. So dividing that by five gives us an answer of 26. So the mean is 26, and the mean is found by adding up all the values and dividing by the number of values. Okay, and the next topic, the next topic is the range. And the range tells us how spread out our 
data is or our data is. Okay, uh, so I've obviously been teaching England for too long. So we've got our data, our data, and we've got the range is the largest, subtract the smallest. And the number of shots taken in Crazy Golf are five, eight, four, three, five, two, and seven. And we want to find the range. We need to find our largest value. So our largest value is eight, and our smallest value is two. So take away two, and eight take away two is equal to six. So the range for this information, avoiding the word data, data, is equal to, the range for this information is six. It's the difference between the largest and the smallest value. Okay, our next topic. Okay, sometimes we're asked to find the mode from a table. So here we've got some information, and we've got the age of some people, and they're five, or people, or animals, or whatever it is, with the age of something, and the ages are five, six, seven, and eight, and we've got the frequency. So there's two five-year-olds, two six-year-olds, five seven-year-olds and one eight-year-old. Now, whenever you find in the mode from a table, it changes the word from often the mode age to the modal age. And we're trying to find the modal age. That just means the most common age. And remember, we had five seven-year-olds. So that means that that was the most common age. So the mode here would be the one with the highest frequency, which is seven. So the mode or the modal age is seven. Our next topic is finding the mean from a table. So we want to find the mean from this table. And remember to find the mean, we add up all the values and divide by the number of values. So we've got two five-year-olds, two six-year-olds, five seven-year-olds, and one eight-year-old. So we could write down two five-year-olds, so five five, two six-year-olds, six six, five seven-year-olds, right there was all out, you know, so seven, 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 and one eight-year-old. And then you could just add them all up manually, but these numbers might be quite, might be a bit larger. So let's find an easier way to do that. So we want to find the grand total. Now this, if there's two five-year-olds, I add on this column called the FX column, and that stands for the frequency multiplied by whatever column this is. So if there's two five-year-olds, well, five plus five is 10, but another way to do that is just two two times five, and two times five is 10. If there's two six-year-olds, we could do six plus six, but two times six is 12, so 12. If there's five seven-year-olds, well, five times seven is 35. And one eight-year-old, well, that's just gonna be one times eight is eight. So we find this column called the FX column, and it's found by multiplying the frequency by whatever the values are in the table. And then if we add that up, we will get the grand total, because we know that if there's two five-year-olds, that's 10 years. If there's two six-year-olds, that's another 12 years. If there's five seven-year-olds, that's another 35. And if you add those up, you'll get the grand total. And that's equal to 65. So if you added up all the ages, that would be 65. Now we need to divide that by how many people there were. Well, if we look at the frequencies and add those up, there's two, two, five, and one. So it's two five-year-olds, two six-year-olds, and so on. So two plus two is four, plus five is nine, plus one is 10. So altogether there was 10 people. So if we do the total, which is 65, divided by 10, that would tell us the mean age. So 65 divided by 10 would be 6.5. So the mean age is 6.5. Okay, our next topic. The next topic is to find the median from a table. So the median is the middle value. So if you look at this table, we're trying to find the middle value. So one way to do it is to arrange them all in order. So to write down two 18 year olds, we could write down two 18 year olds, three 19 year olds. We could write down 13 20 year olds and one 21 year old. So there we've got all the ages and then we want to find the median or the middle one. So we can then just work out the middle one. So. And as you can see, the median age is 20. So the median would be 20. So that's one way to do it, is to list down all the ages in one list and then just find the middle one. So another way to do it though, is we can consider the frequencies. Now altogether, we've got two people, three people, another 13 people and one person. So if you add those up, you'll find there's 19 people altogether. And if we were to line up 19 people, well, the median person would be the 10th person. Let's see why that would be. Well, if you had three people, one, two, three, the median is the middle one, which is the second person. And then you can find that by doing three plus one, which is four and half it is the second one. If you had five people, one, two, three, four, five, you could then add one, which is six people, and divide by two, which is then the third person. If you had, for instance, six people, one, two, three, four, five, six, you could add one, which would be seven, and divide by two is 3.5. And if you look, one, two, three, 0.5, that would be the median. So if you had 19 people, you could add one, which is 20, and, and divide by two, which would be the 10th person. And the 10th person, if you line these people up in order of age, the 10th person wouldn't be in 
person here, there's only two 18 year olds. The 10th person wouldn't be here because there's only five so far. And the 10th person would definitely be in this group of people. So the 10th person would be 20 years old. So you can choose which way you want to do it. You could list out all the ages. Or you, so if they're values such as 18, 19, 20, 21, and so on, you could take the frequency, add one, and divide by two. And that'll tell you the position of the median, and then you could find it. And it's up to you which approach you use. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is tally charts. And whenever you're doing a tally chart, it's important to know that whenever you've got to five people, you go one, two, three, four, and the fifth person is across. And then you just carry on. So here we've got a tally chart, and we've got Monday. There's five, 10, 12, and that's the frequency 12. On Tuesday, there's one, two, three. So let's complete this, three. On Wednesday, the frequency seven. So we need to do seven. So that'll be one, two, three, four, five. And then we've got two more, six, seven. On Thursday, let's count up in fives, five, 10, 15, and then another four, that's gonna be 19 people on Thursday. And finally, Friday, there's 10, so that's gonna be one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, and that's it. So tally charts, if you wanna revise tally charts, it's video 321 on corporate maths. Okay, our next topic. So next topic is pictograms. So you can find videos on pictograms on video 161 and 162 on corporate maths. So here's an example on a pictogram. So a pictogram uses symbols to represent a number. And here we've got a pictogram shows the information about the number of hours of sunshine in four cities during a day in June. So we've got Paris, Cork, London, and Swansea. And we've got each circle here and we've got a key and it's very important that if you are drawing a pictogram, you include a key. And we've got this key, a circle represents four hours. So that means that the whole circle represents four. Half a circle would represent, a semicircle would represent two. A quarter of a circle would represent one. And three quarters of a circle would represent three. So let's have a look at Paris. We've got four, and then we've got another four, so that's eight, and then another two, so that's gonna be 10 altogether. Then you've got Cork, so that's four, eight, 12, so there's 12 hours of sunshine in Cork. London, so you've got four, and then another three, so that's seven altogether over there. And then you've got Swansea, and you've got four, eight, and then another one, so that's nine altogether there. And the question says, how many more hours of sunshine did Paris have than London? So Paris had 10, and London had seven. To find out how many more hours of sunshine, we just need to take those away to find the difference. 10 take away seven is three. So the answer would be three hours. Okay, and our next topic, our next topic is bar charts, and that's videos 147 and 148 in Cobra Mavs. And here's a typical question. We've got a bar chart, and we've been asked some questions about it. So here's a bar chart showing the number of ice creams sold going up vertically from zero up to 400. And we've got day of the week going across the horizontal axis, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And the first question says, on which two days were the same number of ice creams sold? So we're looking for the same number of ice cream sold. So we're looking for the bars being the same height. So if you look here, we've got Wednesday and Friday where we've got the bars that are the same height as each other. So that means that Wednesday and Friday would be the two days of the week where the same number of ice creams were sold. So Wednesday and Friday. Okay, the next question says, how many more ice creams were sold on Thursday than Friday? So if we look at Thursday, we've got our bar going up here and we've gone past 300. So let's see what this number would be. So we've gone up from zero up to 100. So let's see how many squares there are gone up from zero to 100. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. So if we divide 100 by five, we get that's equal to 20. That must mean we're going up in 20. So let's check 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, yeah. So if we're at 300, that's gonna be 320 and 340. So altogether, there were 340 ice cream sold on Thursday. And on Friday, well, we've got 100, then it's gonna be 120, 40, 60, and 80. And then another one will be 200, so yep, so that's 180. So it says, how many more ice creams were sold on Thursday than Friday? So if we take away 180 from 340, that would tell us how many more ice creams were sold. And that would be 160. Our next topic is line graphs. So here we've got a line graph and we've got frequency going up vertically and we've got the time of the day going across horizontally. So we've got 0, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 going up vertically. And then we've got the time 9 o'clock, 11, 1 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 5 o'clock and 7 p.m. So we're going up in two hours there as we go across. And the question says, Sally records the number of cars in a car park every two hours. So this is the number of cars in the car park at each of the times. She began at 9 a.m and finished at 7 p.m. The line graph shows her results. When were the most cars in the car park? So that'd be whenever the line graph's at its highest point. And as you can see here, uh, it had 90 cars at 1 p.m. And the question said, when were most cars in the car park? So that would be 1 p.m. The next question said, how many less cars 
we're in the car park at 3 p.m. to 1 p.m. So if we look at 1 p.m., well, we know there's 90 cars then. And if we look at 3 p.m., we've got us just above the 60. Let's see what we're going up in here. So we've got we've got 10 squares, and that's 20 cars. So 20 divided by 10 is 2. So we're going up in 2s. So that would be, if we counted up to 2s, that would be 20. So we've got 60, 62. So if we do 90, take away 62, that would tell us how many less cars were in the car park at 3 o'clock than 1 o'clock. And that would be 28. Our next topic is stem and leaf. So stem and leaf is a great way to represent information in order. So represent numbers in order. And if we've got here, this would be videos 169 and 170 in corporate maths. And the question says, the following stem and leaf diagram shows the times taken for 15 people to complete a jigsaw. So we've got the key, and that's very important for a stem and leaf. So three line one means 31 minutes. So we're dealing with minutes here. And we've got 31, 39, 40, 43, 46, 51, 57, 57, 58, 59, 60, 63, 64, 66, and 75 minutes. And the question said, what is the modal time taken? So the mode is the most common. So we've got 31, 39, 40, and so on. So if you look here, we've got 57 and 57. So the modal time taken would be 57 minutes. The next question said, find the range of the times taken. So the range is the largest, take away the smallest. So the largest amount of time taken was 75 minutes. And we're going to take away the shortest time, which was 31 minutes. And 75 take away 31 will be equal to 44 minutes. So the range, the difference between the largest and the smallest is 44 minutes. And the last question says, find the median time taken. So the median is the middle value. So I like to do this by crossing off the values in pencil, of course, so crossing off the smallest and then the largest the next smallest, which would be 39, then the next largest, 66, the next smallest, 40, 64, the next smallest, 43, the next largest, 63, the next smallest, 46, the next largest, 60, the next smallest, 51, the next smallest, 59, and then cross off, cross off, and we're left with 57. So the median time taken is 57 minutes. And make sure that with this seven, you remember it's 57. So it's 57 minutes. That's it. So that's a stem and leaf. So it's very important whenever you're doing a stem and leaf diagram to read the key. And if you're drawing one yourself, make sure you include a key. Our next topic is frequency tree. So here's a frequency tree. And we've got morning appointment, evening appointment. So we've got those 40 appointments all together. We know there's 23 in the morning and there's some in the evening. And then we've got on time, late, on time, late. So we've got 40 appointments all together, 23 are in the morning. So if we do 40 take away 23, we'll find out how many evening appointments there were. So 40 take away 23 is 17. So there must have been 17 evening appointments because they need to add together to be 40. Now if we focus on the 23 morning appointments, 21 were on time. So that means there must have been two that were late because 21 plus this number must be 23. So that must be two. And in the evening appointments where there were 17 altogether, five were late so if we do 17 take away five that's 12 so 12 must have been on time and that's it so we've completed the frequency tree and video 376 and corporate miles will give you more information on that okay next topic our next topic is flow charts now flow charts isn't a topic that's appeared very often in m1 it's mentioned in the specification so if it's mentioned i would teach it uh, but it's not one that's come up very often it'd be nice to see it on there and uh, we've got flow charts and we've got starting with the number n equals one use the flow chart to find the printed number so we're going to start here n's equal to one so we're going to start here and we're going to work our way down so we've got inputs one is the number n divisible by two well one's not divisible by two so we're going to go to no Add one, well that's now one plus one is two, so then we're gonna go across. Is two divisible by two? Yes it is, so we're gonna go down. Is two divisible by five? Well no it's not, so we're gonna go up, so we're gonna add one, that's now three. Is it divisible by two? No, so add one, that's now four. Is four divisible by two? Yes it is. Is it divisible by five? No, add one, now we're at five. Is it divisible by two? No, so we add one, that's six. Is it divisible by two? Yes, divisible by five, no, and we carry on. Add one, seven. Is it divisible by two? No, add one, that's eight. Is that divisible by two? Yes, is it divisible by five? No, add one, nine, so we're up here. Is nine divisible by two? No, so add one, 10. And then we go, is 10 divisible by two? Yes, is it divisible by five? Yes, print n, so that's gonna be equal to 10. And that's it, so find the number printed, 10. Perhaps that's why it's not on the exam very often. <laughs> okay, so flow charts, you just follow the instructions really, and you just follow the arrows. Okay, next topic. 
Our next topic is pie charts. So here we've got a table, we've got rugby team, and we've got frequency. So 90 rugby fans were asked which team they supported, England, France, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. And we've got 20 supported England, five supported France, 15 supported Ireland, 25 supported Scotland, and 25 supported Wales. Okay, and we're gonna draw a pie chart for this information. So if you draw a pie chart, typically there'll be a circle drawn for you, with a line there going from the center up to the top for you. And we're gonna draw a pie chart for this. So to draw a pie chart, the first thing you need to do is add up the frequencies. Well, we know there's 90 rugby fans, so if we add them all up, we'll find there's 90. Then we need to divide the whole circle, 360, by that number of people. So 360 divided by 90 is equal to 4. So that means that each person is given 4 degrees in the circle, so each person is 4 degrees. Now, 20 people supported England. Now, each of those people get four degrees. So if we multiply that by four, we'll see how, what size of angle they should have in the pie chart. 20 times four is equal to 80. So the angle we're gonna draw for England fans would be 80 degrees. Next, we're gonna multiply five by four, and we're gonna multiply all these numbers by four because each person gets four degrees. So we're gonna multiply by four, multiply by four, multiply by four, and multiply by four. So five times four is 20 degrees. So we'll draw 20 degrees for the French fans. 15 times four is 60 degrees for the Irish fans. That should be much bigger. Then we've got 25 times four. 25 times four is 100, so 100 degrees for the Scottish fans. And 25 times four, 25 times four is 100. And then we've got all our angles. Now I like to add these up to make sure I get 360. 80 plus 20 is 100, plus 60 is 160, plus another 100 is 260, plus another 100 is 360 degrees. And that's it. So whenever you draw on a pie chart, you need to add up the frequencies, then divide 360 by the total frequency to find the number of degrees per person or per item or whatever you're looking at, and then multiply all the frequencies by that number to find the angle you should draw. Okay, so we're going to draw 80 degrees for the English fan. So let's start off by going to our pie chart, and we're going to get our protractor and we're going to line it up like so so that the cross goes in the in the center of the circle like so and then the zero goes at the top and we're drawing an 80 degree angle so we're going to go around to where 80 degrees is so that's here and we'll do a little dot now you'll move your protractor and you will draw a nice straight line so let's move our protractor and you draw a nice straight line from the center through that point to the edge of the pie chart like so so that's for the English fans, so let's label it for English fans, so England, so like so, and that's that sector done. And it's an 80 degree angle, so we can put that in as well if we want to. Next, we're going to draw an angle of 20 degrees for the French fans. So we're going to get our protractor, we're going to have to turn it so that we put our zero along the line we've just drawn. You always put the zero on the line you've just drawn, or if there's no lines there yet, the one at the top. So we started off with the zero at the top line because that was the only line. Now we've drawn this line, we're gonna put zero there, and we're gonna draw an angle of 20 degrees. So we go to zero, we go around to where 20 degrees is. So that's here, so put a dot, and then move our protractor and draw a nice straight line through there with a ruler and a pencil. So it looks something like that. So that's 20 degrees. You don't necessarily need to put the angles in, but we do need to put it in. We do need to label that it's France. Okay, next was Ireland. And if we go back and look, that was 60 degrees. So we're going to get our protractor. We're going to turn it. So the zero is along the line we've just drawn. So we're going to rotate it slightly. Again, the cross has to go in the center of the circle and zero is on the line, like so. And then we're going to go from zero around to 60 degrees for the Irish fans. So to there, 60, move our protractor. So move our protractor and draw a nice straight line from the center of the circle through that point and to the edge. And again, what we're gonna do is we're gonna label it for Ireland. And we can put the angle in if we want to, so that's 60 degrees, so you don't need to do that bit, but again, label it for Ireland. Next was the Scottish fan, so that was 100 degrees. So again, take our protractor and rotate it so that the zero is on that new line like so. So start off at zero and we're going to go around to 100 degrees. So we're going to start on the outside, go around 10, 20, all the way around to 80, 90 and 100. So remember, we are dealing with the outside numbers here. So don't look at this in inside 100. We're dealing with the outside numbers. So we're going zero all the way around to 100 there. Again, move our protractor and draw a nice straight line from the center of the pie chart through that point to the edge. And that will be for the Scottish fans. So Scotland to 100 degrees. And finally, the last sector will be for wheels. That should be already drawn for us for 100 degrees because that's all that's left. But let's check it. So let's take our protractor and rotate it. And when you do that, you can clearly see that is 100 degrees. And that's it. 
Okay, so let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is scatter graphs, and that's video 165 in Corporate Mavs, and we're going to plot these points on a scatter graph. So this is the cost of some cars. We've got the age of the car and the cost of the car, and you've got age along the bottom and cost going up vertically. So we've got a four-year-old car, cost £6,000. So if we go a four-year-old car and up to 6000 and plot a point like so. A seven-year-old car costs £3,000. So a seven-year-old car, £3,000. A two-year-old car costs £7,500. Two-year-old car, 7,500. So we've got 7,000 in the middle of 6,000 and 8,000. So 7,500 will be in the middle. So here. A four year old car costs 5,000 pounds. So a four year old car costs 5,000 pounds. So that's there. A one year old car costs 8,000 pounds. So a one year old car costs 8,000 pounds. A nine year old car costs 1,500 pounds. So a nine year old car costs 1,500. So we've got 1,000, 2,000. So 1,500 will be in the middle there. We've got a three-year-old car, costs £6,000, so a three-year-old car costs £6,000. And well, finally, we've got a six-year-old car, costs £4,000, so a six-year-old car costs £4,000, and that's our points. And let's just check them, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then you can see we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we've plotted all our points on the scatter graph. Now you may be asked a question such as, you know, as the age of the car gets larger, the cost of the car gets blank, and then you do smaller. And that's what it shows. It shows you as the age of the car goes up, the cost goes down. So you might be given a sentence to complete or something like that uh, that shows it. And that's that. And if you're studying for M2, then you might find that scatter graphs are taking just a little bit further. Okay, so we're now going to look at our algebra topics. So that's the blue topics on your revision checklist. And we're going to start off by looking at some algebraic notation. So that's video 19 on corporate maths. So let's have a look and make sure we know what each of these algebraic expressions mean. So we've got x plus 3, that means a number plus 3. If we've got x take away 4, that means a number take away 4 or 4 less than a number. We've got 10 subtract x, that means that it's 10 take away whatever x is or x less than 10. We've got 4x. Now that means 4 times x, because in algebra we don't write the multiplication sign, so 4x means 4 times x. So if we knew what x is, you just multiply by 4. Next, we've got this x and then the line 2. So remember in a fraction, the line means divided by, so we've got x divided by 2. And we sometimes call this x over 2 or x divided by 2. So this is x over 2, which means x divided by 2. And finally, we've got x squared, and that just means x squared. So if we knew what x is, we would multiply it by itself, because to square something means to multiply it by itself. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is writing expressions or forming expressions, and that's video 16 on Corbin Maths. So we've been told that Jake is X years old. So he's X years old. We don't know how old he is. He could be 10, he could be 50, he could be 100, he could be 67, we don't know. Anna's nine years older than Jake. So whatever age he is, she's nine years older. And Beth is twice as old as Jake. So she's twice his age. And the first question says, write an expression for Anna's age. So if we knew how old Jake was, we would add nine onto it to find Anna's age. But we don't know it, so we're just going to write down he's x, and we would add on 9, so an expression for her age is x plus 9. The next question says write an expression for Beth's age. Now, she's twice as old as Jake, so whatever age he is, you'd multiply it by 2. So we want to times his age, x by 2. Now, remember in algebra, we don't write the multiplication sign, so we just write 2x, and that means 2 times x, 2 times his age. Okay, our next topic. Okay, our next topic is on collecting like terms. And so that means we're going to simplify expressions such as this one, such as 7x plus y, take away x plus 5y. And that's video 9 in corporate maths. So if you do want to recap this, watch video 9 in corporate maths. Okay, so we've got 7x plus y, take away x plus 5y. So when we're collecting like terms, we collect the like terms. So let's start off with our x's. We've got 7x's, so here we've got 7x's, and we've got subtract an x. So if you get 7x's and you take away an x or 1x, you'll be left with 6x's. So let's write that down, 6x. Now let's deal with our y's. We've got plus y, so that's positive y or 1y. And we're going to add another 5y's. So if we added 1y and another 5y's altogether, that's adding 6y's. So it'd be 6x plus 6y. And that's it. So we've simplified an expression by collecting the like terms. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is multiplying terms, which is video 18. And here we've been given 9 times y. Now remember in algebra, we don't write the multiplication sign. So if we're doing 9 times y, we would just write 9y. Here we've got 4x multiplied by 5. 
So that's four lots of x, but we've got five lots of it. So we've got a 4x, a 4x, a 4x, a 4x, and a 4x. If you added all those 4x's up, you would have five lots of four. That'd be 20x's altogether. Now, if I was multiplying 4x by five, I would just take the four and times it by five. So that's 20. And then it's 20 lots of x, so just 20x, like so. OK, now we're going to look at expanding brackets. So sometimes we're asked to expand or to multiply out a bracket. And that's video 13 on corporate maths. So here we've got our first question. We've been told to expand six bracket y plus seven. That means we've got six lots of the bracket y plus seven. So we've got y plus seven, y plus seven, y plus seven, y plus seven. You know, we've got six of them. And we want to find out what we've got all together. Now, if you had y plus seven, y plus seven, all six times, you would have six y's all together. And a quick way to do that is just to do six times y. So six times y is six y. And then if you had y plus 7, y plus 7, y plus 7, y plus 7, you had 6 of them, that would be you'd be adding 7 6 times. And 6 times 7 is 42, so we'll be adding 42. So it'd be plus 42. And a quick way to do that is to just multiply whatever's in the bracket by the number outside. So you just do 6 times y is 6y. And then you do 6 times 7, and 6 times 7 is 42. So to multiply a bracket or to expand a bracket, you just multiply what's inside by the number outside. And in M1, it would just be a constant, a number outside the bracket. OK, and our next one, we've got 2 bracket 1 minus 3x. So we're going to multiply what's inside by 2. So 1 times 2 is 2. And then we've got a minus and so minus. And then we're going to do 2 times 3x is 6x. So our answer would be 2 minus 6x, just like that. Just be careful if you did have a minus 2 outside of here that you would be doing minus 2 times 1, which would be minus 2. And if you have minus 2 times minus 3x, that would be then. And remember, a negative times a negative is a positive. Here it's just a positive 2, so we're just going to do 2 times 1 and 2 times 3x and make sure we put our minus sign in the middle. That's it. OK, let's have a look at our next topic, which is factorising, which is video 117. So to factorise an expression, what we do is we want to put the brackets back in. So we wanted to figure out what was expanded or what we had multiplied out. It's the opposite of expanding. So to factorise, if you've got 15x plus 20 here, to factorise it, you think, what's the biggest thing that you can divide both of these by? What's the highest common factor of 15x and 20? So if I've got 15 and 20, well, the biggest thing I can divide these by is 5. So I'm going to put 5 outside the brackets and then open the brackets, and then I'm going to divide both of these by 5. So 15x divided by 5, well, that would be 3x. And then 20 divided by 5 is 4. So it would be 4, and it's plus. Next, we've got factorised 12y minus 36. So if I've got 12y and 36, the biggest thing you can divide these by is 12, because 12y is obviously divisible by 12, and 36 is divisible by 12 as well. So we put 12 and then brackets. Now 12y divided by 12, well, that should be 1y, or we would just write y. And then we've got minus, and then we've got 36 divided by 12, and 36 divided by 12 is 3. And let's just check it. 12 times y is 12y, and 12 times 3 is 36, and we had a minus sign. So 12 times minus 3 is minus 36, and that's it. So that's how you factorize expressions. And in M1, it will just be a number. So our next topic is substitution. So that's video 20 on corporate maths. And we've been given the question, given that w equals 9 and y equals 5, find the value of 8w minus 3y. So remember in algebra, we don't write the multiplication sign. So 8w means 8 times w or 8 times whatever value w is. In this case, it's 9. And then subtract 3 times y. So that's 3 times whatever value y is, and that's 5. So let's work out what 8w is. So that's 8 times w, so that's 8 times 9. And that's equal to 72. So 8w is 72, and we're going to take away whatever 3 times y is. So 3 times 5 is equal to 15. So 3y is 15. And then we're going to do 72, take away 15, and that's equal to 57. So 8w subtract 3y. If w is equal to 9 and y is equal to 5, then that would be equal to 57. And that's it. OK, our next question. Now, with substitution, sometimes it's just substituting the values into an algebraic expression, such as this. Sometimes we've got a formula which involves words, and we've got to substitute values into that. So here we've got Erin uses this formula to work out how long it should take to cook a turkey. Now, I've just made this up, so please don't be cooking turkeys using this formula. So we've got the cooking time in minutes is equal to 90 plus the weight of the turkey in kilograms times 20. And the question says, how long should it take to cook a 7 kilogram turkey? So it's the weight of the turkey in kilograms, that's 7 times 20. And then we're going to do 90 plus whatever that is. So remember our order of operations, we've got to do the multiplication before we do the addition. So we're going to do 7 times 20. So 7 times 20 is equal to 140. And then we've got 90 plus 140. So 90 plus 140 
is equal to 230 minutes. And that's it. So our next topic is solving equations, and that's video 110 on corporate maths. So we've got some equations here we're going to solve. We've got w plus 9 is equal to 24. Now whenever we're solving an equation, what we want to do is we want to work out what value w is. So we want to get the w on its own. We want w equals and then a number. So what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of this plus 9. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the inverse. So the opposite of add 9 is take away 9 from both sides of this equation. So w plus 9, take away 9. So that gets rid of the plus 9, so we're just left with w. And on the right-hand side, we've got 24, take away 9, that's equal to 15. So that means our answer is w equals 15. So our next equation, our next equation is x minus 7 equals 8. So you want to get the x on its own, so you want to get rid of this take away 7. The opposite of take away 7 is add 7, so add 7 to both sides of this equation. So we've added 7 to get rid of the minus 7, so we're just going to be left with x. And on the right-hand side of this equation, we've got 8 plus 7, and 8 plus 7 is equal to 15. So x is equal to 15. Okay, our next equation, so we've got 3x equals 24. So that's 3 times x equals 24. So we want to get the x on its own, so we want to get rid of this multiplied by 3. And the opposite of multiplying by 3 is divide by 3, so we're going to divide both sides of this equation by 3. So we've got 3x, and we're going to divide that by 3, so that's 1x, or just x. And then on the right-hand side, we've got 24 divided by 3, that's equal to 8. And finally, we've got c divided by 2 is equal to 7. Now we want to get rid of this divide by 2, so we're going to do the opposite, which is times by 2, and times by 2. We're timesing by 2 to get rid of the divide by 2, so we're just left with c, so c equals, and 7 times 2 is 14. So that would be 14. So that's how we solve these equations. Okay, next. Okay, now we've got some more equations, and these ones have got two steps. So we've got 4w minus 7 equals 9. So we want to get the w on its own. So what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of this minus 7 to begin with. So we're going to do the opposite of minus 7, which is add 7 to this side and to the other side. So we've added 7 to get rid of the minus 7. That's just going to leave us with 4w. So we've got 4w equals. And on the right-hand side of the equation, we've got 9 plus 7. And 9 plus 7 is equal to 16. So we've got 4w equals 16. Now we want the w on its own. So this is 4 times w. So we're going to divide by 4 and divide by 4. We've divided by 4 to get rid of the times by 4. So we're just left with w. And on the right-hand side of the equation, we've got 16 divided by 4. And 16 divided by 4 is 4. Now it's very important to practice this topic of solving equations. So please make sure you're doing the questions in the practice booklet, the booklet that accompanies this video. But also have a look at video 110. And then there's practice questions and textbook exercises beside that. And it's a good idea to practice this. Okay, our next equation is c divided by 2 plus 1 equals 6. So what we want to do is we want to get the c on its own, so let's get rid of this plus 1. So we're going to minus 1 and minus 1 from both sides of the equation. So on the left-hand side, we had c divided by 2 plus 1, but we've, so we've taken away 1, so this is going to leave us with c divided by 2. And on the right-hand side of the equation, we had 6, we take away 1, so that's 5. Now we've got c divided by 2, so we're going to want to get rid of this divide by 2, so we're going to times by 2 and times by 2. So on the left hand side, we had c divided by 2, we times by 2 to get rid of the divide by 2, so that's going to leave us with c. And on the right hand side, we had 5 times 2, and 5 times 2 is equal to 10. So c is equal to 10, and that's it. Okay, our next topic. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is forming equations. So here we've got some information, and we're going to form an equation out of it. So we've got Daniel is x years old. Daisy is five years older than Daniel, so she's five years older than him, so he's x. So to find her age, you would do x plus five, so we'd write x plus five, that's Daisy's age. And Chris is twice Daniel's age, so Daniel is x, and we're going to times it by two to get Chris's age, so that would be 2x. And the sum of their ages is 53. And our first question says, A, form an equation using the information given. So we've got the sum of their ages is 53. And remember the word sum means to add up, so if we add up our x, our x plus 5 and our 2x, we will get the sum of their ages, and we know that's equal to 53. So x plus x plus 5 plus 2x, so the sum of their ages equals 53. So let's collect our like terms. Let's do x plus x plus 2x's. So x plus x is 2x plus another 2x's is 4x's. And we've still got our plus 5 that's equal to 53. So that is our equation. We've got an equation 4x plus 5 is equal to 53. 
And part B says solve the equation to find Daniel's age. So we're going to solve this equation. So let's then get rid of this plus 5 by take away 5 and take away 5. So we'll leave us on the left hand side with 4x because we took away 5 to get rid of the plus 5. On the right hand side of the equation we had 53 take away 5 is equal to 48. Now we've got 4 times x is equal to 48. Well, we don't want this multiplied by 4, so let's divide by 4 and divide by 4. So 4x divided by 4 is just x. And on the right-hand side, we had 48 divided by 4, that's equal to 12. Uh, so Daniel was x years old, so we know that x is equal to 12, so Daniel is 12. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Our next topic is function machines. So here's a function machine, and we've got input, multiply by 3, subtract 8, and that gives us our output. So part A says work out the output when the input is equal to 7. So we've got the input's equal to 7. We're going to multiply that by 3. 7 times 3 is 21. And then we're going to subtract 8. So 21 take away 8 is 13. So if the input is 7, the output is 13. Okay, our next part says work out the input if the output is 22. So we've got the output. Well, let's get rid of this working out from our other part. So we've got the output is 22. And then we've got subtract 8. Well, we're going to do the inverse. So we're going the opposite way. So we're going to do 22 plus 8. And 22 plus 8 is 30. And then instead of multiplying by 3, we're going the opposite way. So we're going to divide by 3. And 30 divided by 3 is 10. So our input would be 10 whenever our output is 22. And we can check that. If we had 10 times 3 is 30, subtract 8 is 22. So we've done part A and part B, and part C says find an expression for the output when the input is x. So if the input is x, we're going to multiply by 3, well that's 3x, and then we're going to subtract 8, so that's 3x subtract 8, and that's it. So an expression for the output would be 3x subtract 8. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is coordinates. So that's video 84 in corporate maths. So here we've got a set of axes, and we've got some coordinates. We've got A, B, C, and D. And we're going to write down the coordinates of these four points. And whenever we write down coordinates, uh, some people remember the saying along the corridor up the stairs. So I'm going to use that just to help us find these coordinates. So the coordinates of point A. So we've got A, and as you can see here, we've started the origin. So that's this point here, the origin. And to get the A, we'll go two along the corridor and four up the stairs. So the coordinates would be two, four. Next, the coordinates of the point B. So we'd start again at the origin. We're going to go two along the corridor, so that's going to be two. And then we go down to minus two, so we're going to go down two. So the coordinates of this point here is two minus two. Next, the coordinates of this point C. So again, we start at the origin. We're going to cross the minus five and up one. So it's going to be minus five, one. And finally, the coordinates of the point D, well, we're not going left or right, we're not going to cross anywhere, and we're just going to go straight down 4, so the coordinates would be 0, minus 4. So that's it. Okay, and our next topic. Our next topic is drawn linear graphs. So that is drawn a straight line graph. And we've been asked to draw the graph of y equals 2x plus 1. So we're going to plot the coordinates where the y value of the coordinate is twice the x coordinate plus 1. So to do that, sometimes in the question they give you a table, but occasionally in M1 they haven't given a table, so I'm going to show you how to do this without a table. But if they give you a table, it should look something like this. So it starts off with x and y, and then you've got some values of x at the top, so it could be something like minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2. And if they haven't drawn a table for you, you would just do something like this. And to find what y is, well, y is equal to 2 times x plus 1. So we're going to substitute in these values of x into this, and we're going to find what y is. So we've got 2x plus 1. So we're going to times all the x coordinates, all these numbers by 2, and add 1. So let's start off here with our 2. 2 times 2 is 4. Add 1 would be 5. This point is 1. So 2 times 1 is 2, plus 1 is 3. Next, if x is equal to 0, 2 times 0 is 0, plus 1 is 1. Now we've got some negative numbers, 2 times minus 1, well 2 times minus 1 or negative 1. Remember a positive times a negative is a negative, so 2 times 1 is 2, so it's going to be negative 2. Add 1 means going back up towards 0, so it'll be minus 1. And finally, we're going to do 2 times negative 2, now 2 times negative 2 would be negative 4. Add 1, going back up towards 0, would be minus 3. And, and that's it, so we've got our coordinates, now we just need to plot them. This is a set of coordinates here, 2, 5, 1, 3, 0, 1, negative 1, negative 1, and negative 2, negative 3. So we'll plot these five points and then draw a nice straight line through them. So let's start off with 2, 5, so 2 across 5 up, so it's going to be here. 1, 3, 1 across 3 up is going to be here. 0, 1, or 0 across and then just 1 up, that's there. 
minus 1, minus 1, so it's negative 1, negative 1, so it's going to be here. And finally, negative 2, negative 3, so it's going to be negative 2, negative 3 down there, and that's that point. And then get a ruler and a pencil and draw a nice straight line through those points, and it looks something like this. And that's it. So that's how you draw a straight line graph. You're going to create a table if there's not one for you. And then you just follow the rule here. It's multiplied by 2, 2 times x plus 1. And then just work out the coordinates and then plot them. OK, our next topic. Our next topic is real life graph. So here's a situation. We've got charge. So it's a charge for a job. It starts at 0. So it goes 0, 40, 80, 120, and so on up the vertical axis. Along the horizontal axis, we've got hours worked. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And the question says, how much does Dara charge for a job lasting two hours? So if we go to our graph and we go to two hours and we go up to the line and across, we can see that's £120. So Dara would charge £120. Next, a job costs £180. How long did it last? So if we go to 180, now it's going to be halfway between 160 and 200. It's going to be in here in the middle. So if we go across, we get to here and then down. That's five hours. So the job lasts five hours. And our last question is, how much does Dara charge for each hour? Well, if we look at one hour and two hours, we can see what the increase is. So we can see how much extra he charged for an extra hour. So we can look at one hour and see how much the price is. We can look at two hours and see how much the price is. And then we can see how much it's gone up by. And that would tell us how much Dara charges for each hour. So for a one hour job, you can see it's in the middle of 80 and 120. So that's 100 pound there. For a two hour job, you can see it's gone up to 120. So it's gone up by 20. And let's just check. For a no hour job, his initial call out is £80. For a one hour job, it goes up to 100 so that's gone up 20 It's gone up another 20 to 120 For a three hour job, it's 140 For a four hour job, it's 160 and so on. So for each hour, Dara charges £20. And that's it. So we have gone through every single topic that's mentioned in the M1 specification and also all the list of topics that I've ever spotted whenever I've studied and gone through all the papers. So these are all the topics that you need to know for M1. And this video, the aim of it has been to go through and to spend a couple of minutes in every single one of these topics. If you do need any extra help, I'd highly recommend you print off this slide. It's in the description below and have that printed off and kept with you whenever you're studying for M1. And if you do need any extra help, you've got all the video numbers where you can watch the video tutorial on each individual topic in a lot more detail. And also you've got then the practice questions and textbook exercises that you can work on as well. So I really, really hope you find this video useful. Remember, there is that ultimate SEA M1 revision question booklet. So that had questions on every single topic we've gone through. So whenever you watch this video, you may have written notes, paused it after each topic, done the questions on it, made sure you understood it, and then carried on. Those questions are straightforward questions. They're just to make sure you're totally familiar with the topic. Um, have a look at the practice questions on this to find them problem solving questions and those real curve balls. So, you know, it's quite important to have a look at those practice questions as well. But the idea of this book is just to make sure that you're, you know, you are familiar and you're aware of every topic that can, you can encounter. Um, remember, I've gone through a lot of the revision cards in this uh, video. They would be very useful for you. So if you do want to get those, there's a link to them in the description below as well. And then remember to practice your five a days. There's no, it's no use just cramming your revision into the last week or two just before the exam. That is, if you can work through your M1 revision by working on the numeracy and the foundation five a days, just gradually over the whole way through your GCSE course, working on those just five, 10 minutes every single day, it'll make a massive difference. So again, I hope you find this video useful. This has been the ultimate SEA M1 revision video. Um, I hope you haven't watched it in one go. But again, thanks very much for watching. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Please like the video. Thank you so much and really good luck with your studies. Okay, all the best. Bye-bye.